Good afternoon. Good evening. How are you? I'm uh, good. Oh, wow. you want to, uh, get some energetic. Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order Monday, August the 21st at 7.01 p.m. And certainly want to welcome all of you that are in attendance with us this evening. If we could just take a moment of silence, please, meditation. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we are pleased on this eclipse day uh, <laughs> to have Reeve Sampson, a distinguished volunteer from the North Carolina Museum of Life and Science, uh, to lead us in the pledge. May we stand? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Did you see the eclipse? Did you Brief. see it? Yeah. Good, good. Move <laughs> your glasses. Okay, great. Microphones are not working. Are these microphones working? Can you hear me? Yeah. If you want to switch seats, I'm happy to do that. No, I'll just speak. Don't do it. Don't do it, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <laughs> when I ask the clerk if she would call the roll, please. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Present. Councilmember Davis. Here. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. And Councilmember Shule. Here. Thank you. Yeah, several ceremonial items. Is this on? Okay. This evening. Uh, the first I'd like to ask Ms. Robin Davis <coughs> if she would join me. And Ms. Davis, if you care to bring others with you, that's certainly fine. Come up here if you don't mind. Ms. Davis is the recipient of this month's Neighborhood Spotlight Award. And as probably many of you know, this is a recognition of individuals and in their communities who have done outstanding jobs and uh, have been recognized and recommended for this award. This is sponsored by the Neighborhood Improvements Department. Uh, and it reads that Ms. Davis was, is a resident of the Albright neighborhood and was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work, wonderful work that she has done and continues to do in her neighborhood. And it's included but not limited to organizing street-wide meetings at her house to discuss neighborhood issues and projects, uh, leading a neighborhood cleanup and beautification project, knocking on hundreds of neighbors' doors to increase community involvement. Uh, participating in multiple local community groups, including PAC-1, Communities in Partnership, Northeast Central Durham Leadership Council, the Albright Neighborhood Association, and the Mayor's Transformation in 10 Initiative. And we want to congratulate Ms. Davis on being selected for this month's award and certainly want to recognize her for all the things she has done and continues to do to make uh, this community great for all. And we talk about Neighborhoods, uh, we talk about strong neighborhoods making a strong city, but obviously in those neighborhoods live people, residents, who make that happen. Ms. Davis is an example of that. Uh, the award reads, uh, this certificate is awarded to Robin Davis in recognition of valuable contributions to the Albright neighborhood, which is on Spruce Street, and as I indicated, for organizing streetwide meetings at a home to discuss neighborhood issues and projects, for leading a neighborhood cleanup and beautification project, for knocking on hundreds of neighbors' doors to increase community involvement and participating in multiple local community groups, including PAC-1, 
Communities and Partnerships, Northeast Central Durham Leadership Council, the Albright Neighborhood Association, and the Mayor's Transformation in 10 Initiative. And it's signed by Thomas J. Bonfield, our city manager, and myself, William V. Bell Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham. And I'm going to present this to Ms. Robin, and if you have, Ms. Davis, if you have any comments that you'd like to make, feel, feel free to do that. I'm going to ask the Mayor Pro Tem if she would join me. Gloria, would you and Jamie join me, please? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I am reading a proclamation for Women's Equality Day. Let's have a round of applause for that. <laughs> I have already trained the Youth Commission to applaud for just about everything I say. <laughs> Whereas in 1848, women of the United States began organizing peaceful protests for their right to fully and equally participate in workplaces, libraries, organizations, and public facilities, as well as the right to vote and to participate in government. And whereas on August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment was certified, securing women the fundamental right to vote. And whereas in 1971, Congress designated August 26 as Women's Equality Day to serve as a symbol of the ongoing fight for equal rights. And whereas women play a critical role in families, the workplace, and in society as a whole, contributing to our economy and advancing our nation. And whereas Women's Equality Day celebrates the achievements of women and pays tribute to all those who fight for their progress. And whereas Women's Equality Day is an opportunity to recognize the advancements in women's rights and to recommit to the goal of equality. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim Saturday, August 26th, 2017 as Women's Equality Day in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance. Witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this 21st day of August, 2017. I present this to you, Gloria. Tell everybody who you are and some of the activities that we will partake um, uh, the weekend. Thank you very much, Ms. Cora, and everyone here on the City Council and the Mayor. Um, we are having a Women's Equality Day March here in Durham. We're having a rally, and it's going to be fantabulous. Uh, and that's my daughter's word, fantabulous. <laughs> so we're going to be rallying at the American Tobacco Campus at 11 o'clock um, this Saturday again. We're going to have fabulous speakers, wonderful entertainment, and you're just going to have a glorious time because that's Women's Equality Day. And we know how to party, so therefore, we would love for you to be there. Again, thank you again, um, City Council, Mayor, and Ms. Cora for this. This is for you ladies. And, and, and to really put the icing on the cake, we are now ready to move forward with the Mayor's Council for Women in the City of Durham. came into the council chambers, you obviously saw the reception that was taking place uh, for our young people, and they're going to be installed and recognized uh, this evening. I'm going to ask Evelyn Scott, who's the Youth Services Coordinator, if she would join me. But before Evelyn does that, I, I like all of you that are in the audience, 
that are here because you have a young person that you're involved with, whether you're a parent, a relative, a friend, if you would just please stand. Grandmothers, uncles. Oh, no. okay. Well, I, I think we all know that uh, all of us need a lot of support, no matter what we're doing, where it comes from. And to receive support from your family and friends and relatives, I think is probably the utmost type of support that you can receive. So I, I want to congratulate you for what you've done and what you continue to do. Uh, for these young people that are here this evening, and I'm going to turn it over to Evelyn for uh, comments and recognitions. Thank you, Mayor Bell. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I had to write my, my comments down. So I'm Evelyn Scott, and I, along with Roderick Marshall, raise your hand, Rod, we serve as advisors to the Durham Youth Commission um, in the Office on Youth Division of the City Manager's Office. We are all excited. Um, I hope you all could attest to the excitement that the students displayed outside in the lobby prior to coming in, but they are eagerly excited to begin this term. Um, their charge this year is to bridge the gap between youth and local government and bring awareness to those issues that impact youth across all spectrums. Their charge is to advocate for efficient and effective youth programs and budget priorities in the city of Durham, and they take this charge seriously. So parents, there may be some long days in addition to everything else that the students are working on, um, but know that they're in good hands and that we're going to make Durham the great place that it is today. So at this point, at this time, each student is going to come up. They're going to say their name, their grade, and their school. Um, if they are a returning member, they're going to state the number of years that they've served on the Youth Commission, after which Deputy Clerk Ann Gray will come up and give the oath of office. Um, as soon as we finish taking the oath of office, we'll exit out, and then we'll take a photo right outside, okay? So we can start. Hi, I'm Davis Kramer, and I'm a senior at Jordan High School, and this is my first term. Hi, my name is Tymon Brown. I'm a senior at Southern High School, and this is my fourth term. Jason Beltran, and I'm um, from City of Medicine Academy, and this is my second year as returning. My name is Lorraine Gohe. I'm a senior at Southern High School, and I am a new member. My name is John Pacello, and I'm a junior at Jordan High School, and this is my second year serving on the Durham Youth Commission. Hi, my name is Dominic Hicks. I am, a, I am at uh, Jordan High, and I'm going to be a sophomore this year, and now I'm a new member. Uh, hi, my name is Jake Jeffries. I'm a senior at Durham Academy, and this is my first year on the Youth Commission. Youth, uh, commission. I'm Isaac Atkins Piercy. I'm a senior at Carolina Friends School, and this is my third year. My name is Miles Leathers. I'm a junior at Hillside High School, and this is my second term on the Durham Youth Commission. Hi, my name is Vanessa Taylor. I am a senior at Jordan High School, and this is my second year serving on the Youth Commission. Hi, my name is Jessica Uba, and I'm a junior at City of Medicine Academy, and this is my second term at the Durham Youth Commission. I'm Jenny Uba, I'm a junior at City of Medicine Academy, and this is my second term on the Durham Youth Commission. Hi everyone, my name is Natalie Perkins. I'm a senior at Hillside High School, and this is my second term with the Durham Youth Commission. Good evening everyone, my name is Ray Palma. I am about to be a junior at Riverside High School, and this will be my third term serving on the Durham Youth Commission. Hello, my name is Lirianne Whitehall, and I'm a junior at City Medicine Academy, and this is my first term at the Durham Youth Commission. Um, <laughs> my name is Emerson Atkins Piercy, and I am a freshman at Durham School of the Arts, and this is my first term. My name is 
Samantha Wilkins. I'm a junior at Riverside High School, and this is my first year. Good evening. My name is Sarah Patterson. I am a junior at Durham School of the Arts, and this is my second year on the commission. Hello, my name is Lama Kachab. I am a junior at Voyager Academy, and this is my first year on the Youth Commission. Hi, everyone. My name is Ruben Mansour, and I'm going to be a junior at um, City of Medicine Academy, and this is my second year at the Durham School. Hi, my name is Lucy Jones. I'm a junior at Durham Academy, and this is my first year. Good evening. My name is Michaela McDaniel. I'm a rising junior at Durham School of the Arts, and I'm a new member. Good evening. My name is Aiden Steinbach. I'm a rising junior at Durham School of the Arts, and this is my first term. I do hereby solemnly affirm that I will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States. And the Constitution and laws of North Carolina, not inconsistent therewith. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of my office as a member of the Durham Youth Commission. I want to recognize DeWarren Langley before he leaves. DeWarren, before you leave. Uh, DeWarren, when he was a, a young person. <laughs> when he was younger. When he was younger. <laughs> when you were young, DeWarren. Uh, I'm still saying, when you were young, uh, DeWarren, I um, had a visit from him asking that we start a youth uh, commission in uh, the city of Durham. So he uh, helped to plant the seed for this to take place. So let's give him a round of applause. Okay, let me ask first, are there announcements by members of the council? Recognize Councilwoman Johnson, Councilman Davis, Councilman Reese, in that order. Thank you. I have something to say. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to present a brief statement uh, for adoption by the council. It's a joint city county statement on the um, incident in Charlottesville. The county adopted it at their meeting um, last week, and it's just a, a short um, statement, and I'll just read it out, and then we can um, have a vote on ad adoption. Um, we are angered and heartbroken by the violent, racist, white supremacist, and anti-Semitic gathering that took place on August the 12th, 2017 in Charlottesville, Virginia. We mourn for the life that was lost. We send our support to those who were injured, and we offer our solidarity to those who acted in opposition to these groups. The city and county of Durham condemn, in the strongest possible terms, hate speech, hate crimes, and violence in the service of hatred. These corrupt and immoral ideologies and actions deserve no place in our country. If it's appropriate, Mr. Mayor, I would move that the council um, adopt the statement into the record. Second. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, then get by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. I should have announced to the public, thank you, Jillian, that uh, we don't have our voting machine up this evening, so our, all our votes will be by voice votes or show of hands if necessary. Recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we obviously were just led uh, in the Pledge of Allegiance by, um, by Reeves Sampson, 
Uh, and I want to just give special recognition to the Museum of Life and Science, particularly on this day, but for every day of the year, for the great work that they do with our youth uh, and with our citizens in general. Um, the scientific world is um, enhanced by the work that the North Carolina Museum of Life and Science, and we here in Durham often think of them as our museum, but they belong to the entire state of North Carolina, and they serve populations. Almost any day you go by there, you will see school buses uh, out there from many parts of the state. So I just want to take this time to recognize them and to uh, recognize particularly Mitchell Saber, uh, who is one of the um, administrators there at the museum, and all of the people who do such a wonderful job of carrying on the scientific endeavors that we have here in Durham and in North Carolina. So thank you all, particularly on this day. And thank you again, Rees, for putting forth the pledge. Recognize Councilman Rees. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have two announcements. First of all, I uh, wanted to announce that my nine-year-old daughter, Elle, is here tonight. Hi, Elle. I was really excited to bring her here so that she could hear the Women's Equality Day, Proc Equality Day Proclamation uh, and the Durham Youth Commission induction ceremony. Um, I think what we saw today represents uh, some of the best our community has to offer, and I'm glad that my daughter could be here to experience that. Yes. The second announcement I wanted to make, and you might, you might have heard something about this, Mr. Mayor. Earlier today, the moon traveled in front of the sun <laughs> and from the surface of the planet where we sit right here, 93% of the surface of the sun was obstructed from view by the, by the moon. It is astonishing, Mr. Mayor, and I can't believe I'm the first one to have to announce that. <laughs> we should all be screaming about that at the top of our lungs. It was an astronomical amazement. So we do it now. And I mentioned I mention that just to say this, that we had, um, we've had a bit of a week here in Durham. Um, and it was really nice, I thought, to experience this astronomical wonder today uh, to remind us how small we all are in the grand scheme of things. And that what matters at the end of the day um, is how we treat the people that are in our lives. And um, just wanted to say um, I look forward to viewing the next uh, total eclipse of the sun, uh, hopefully from Cleveland, which will be right in the path of totality. It's lovely this time of year. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Very good. It, it was not an equal opportunity eclipse. Cause it sure oh, that's great. The sun shone bright where I was, but I can understand that. My, recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Am I the last one? I just wanted to recognize Robin Davis again for her work in the community. She has done an outstanding job um, and helped to transform her community. So I want to applaud you again for your courage and tenacity and commitment to community. And also, as, as my uh, council colleagues know, we've been working on uh, the Women's uh, Council for a long, long time, and I think we uh, have it where we're at the point where we can begin advertising. So I just want to let you know that we're going to move forward with the Mayor's Council on Women um, don't be intimidated by that. Embrace us. Um, we just want to make Durham uh, the, a better city. I mean, we are already great, but we're going to be greater than, than we are now. And so I applaud these young women for being here tonight. Stand up again, Jamie and Gloria. Uh, they work hard uh, for women's rights and other rights in this city. And we want to applaud you again for being here. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Shule. Oh, I'm sorry. I asked you that. Oh, okay. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, in response to the um, uh, to the issues and actions that happened in Charlottesville last week, uh, the Human Relations Commission met uh, this afternoon in a special meeting and adopted a resolution. Um, and um, the chair, Diane Standard, came to deliver it to the council. And I assured her that I would be happy to do so. And if I could have just a moment, sure. I would tell you that, um, that they, uh, this is what they adopted. Whereas the City of Durham Human Relations Commission condemns all acts of white supremacy, bigotry, and religious discrimination, and whereas the commission recognizes 
that white supremacy exists not just in rallies, as we have seen in Charlottesville, Virginia, on August 11th and 12th, 2017, and throughout our nation's history, but in the institutions, culture, and history of our city and country. And whereas together, we must work every day to root out this cancerous white supremacy in our own lives and neighborhoods, not only in reaction to moments where hatred becomes visible as mobs marching uninvited through our streets, and whereas we must examine and directly address historical and present conditions that give rise to these moments of racial and religious hatred. Therefore, be it resolved that the Durham Human Relations Commission calls on citizens, elected officials, and other representatives of the city of Durham to end the vast racial inequities in our city, which exist in areas of policing, workers' rights, income, health, small business ownership, and others. Be it further resolved that the Human Relations Commission affirms that Black Lives Matter, be it further resolved that the Durham Human Relations Commission affirms its desire to welcome all people into our communities of whom have been the targets of oppression and discrimination in our country, particularly but not limited to immigrants and refugees, people of Jewish and Muslim faiths, and people regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Be it further resolved that the Durham Human Relations Commission affirms its 2016 resolution stating that we believe that people of all and no religious beliefs must be respected and embraced. Be it finally resolved that the Durham Human Relations Commission is committed to ensuring that all people in our city are free to live without fear of racism and discrimination in all of its forms. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's the resolution that they've asked me to present to you tonight. Thank you, Councilman Moffitt. Thanks to the Human Relations Commission. Are there other announcements by members of the council? If not, then we'll proceed with priority items by the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Priority item uh, this evening is uh, agenda item number 19, which is a public hearing to consider adopting a resolution rescinding six previously ordered petition utility improvements. Would request that we move that public hearing item to be the first public hearing heard this evening. And I'll have some further comments at that time. I'll move the manager's <laughs> item. Second. Been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Recognize the city attorney for any priority items. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And likewise, the city clerk. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. GBA item number 15, which is a public hearing on your agenda, Holloway Street, local historic district, overlay expansion and preservation plan amendment. A protest petition has been filed against this item and it has been ruled not valid. Entertain a motion on the city clerk's vote. Move, move the item. Second. Been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, then kept by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda. The first item being the consent agenda. The consent agenda items may, can be approved with a single vote. The member of the council, the member of the audience, ask for a consent agenda item to be removed. We'll discuss that later in the agenda program. Uh, item two is Recreation Advisory Commission appointments. Item three is the Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission reappointments. Item four is I-40 westbound at US 15501 interchange project. Item five is new position for transit planning services for Durham Chapel Hill Carver Metropolitan Planning Organization. Item six is neighborhood bike route grant agreement. Item seven is the downtown parking garage project authorization to negotiate and execute a, max, a guaranteed maximum price amendment to the CMAR contract for construction services. Item eight is grant project ordinance for Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act employment funds. Item nine is grant project ordinance for the North Carolina Division of Workforce Solutions Maximize Carolina grant. Item 10 is request to amend grant project ordinance Number 15151, supersedes grant project ordinance number 14969. The Executive Office of the President, Office of National Drug Control Policy, 2016 High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas, grant project ordinance. Item 11 is 2017 Great Offices Building Trust and Community Policing Grant Award. Item 12 is Telecommunications License Agreement. Mobile Light LLC. 
Item 13 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. Items 14 through 19 are items that can be found on the general business agendas as public hearings. Entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, then the capable of saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. We will move to the general business agenda. Item 13, which is the 2017 second quarter crime report presentation. I recognize Chief Davis. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to present this evening on the Durham Police Department's 2017 second quarter report, which covers the first six months of the year. This quarterly report will cover the department's six performance measures, violent crime, property crime, part one index crime, clearance rates, response times to priority one calls, and staffing levels. The accompanying summary includes community activities and significant events during the second quarter. Part one index crime was up 5% during the first six months of 2017 compared to the same period last year. Last quarter, the first quarter of the year, we were up 7%. So we've had a 2% uh, move in the right direction. There have been decreases in two out of seven part one crime categories, homicides and burglaries. As you can see here on this chart, part one index crime has decreased steadily in the past few months of 2017, actually since the month of April compared to the same period in 2016 after a significant spike in the first quarter. Part one violent crime from January to June 2017. Part one violent crime was up 6% during the first six months of 2017 compared to the same period in 2016. The number of homicides actually decreased by 52%. Reported rapes, aggravated assaults, and robberies were up during the first six months of the year. There were 12 homicides and one fatal officer-involved shooting at the end of the second quarter. Three homicides from 2016 were cleared as self-defense in 2017, which under UCR guidelines dropped those three from the 2017 statistics, resulting in an official total of 10. One 2017 case has been ruled as self-defense, leaving 12 cases for 2017. There are only two open cases at this time from the first six months. All 12 cases involve firearms. Investigators have also solved one homicide case from 2014 during the first six months. The number of robberies increased. However, investigators made 130 arrests since the robbery task force began in November 2016. Many significant arrests are mentioned in the second quarter written report. The robbery task force investigators have been assigned more than 500 cases since November. The task force is now staffed with 10 investigators whose primary focus is commercial robberies and robberies committed with firearms. Investigators work closely with the crime analysts and investigators from other agencies, including federal agencies, to share intelligence and develop cases. Many of the arrestees were connected to multiple robberies. This chart reflects aggravated assaults by the month. 33% of all aggravated assaults came from multi-victim firearm incidents during the second quarter, which is the lowest since the end of 2014. We had a spike in January and the numbers have improved since then. As you can see on this particular chart, 
the spike at the beginning of the year in January, and then you see the lower numbers in the months of February, March, April, May, and June. Part one, property crime. Overall property crime was up by 5%. Burglaries were down and at a 10 year low for the second quarter. Property crime makes up 81% of all part one crime compared to 82% during the first six months of 2016. Only a percentage difference. Reported burglaries are still at a three-year low for the first six months of the year. Motor vehicle thefts and larcenies were at three-year highs, crimes of opportunity. We have an investigator who is dedicated to organized retail larceny, and she works closely with investigators from other local jurisdictions to target shoplifting and other retail thefts. Larcenies comprise more than half, 56% of all part one crime. 43% of all reported larcenies were from motor vehicles or involved auto parts and accessories. More than 25% of all larcenies involve shoplifting. The most frequently stolen vehicle during the first six months of the year still remains Honda Accords. <laughs> More than one third, 37% of vehicles stolen during the first six months of 2017 had keys left inside or had the engine running. Clearance rates. Clearance rates for rapes and all part one property crimes were above the FBI national average clearance. However, the FBI clearance rates listed here are for the total numbers for 2015. They still have not released the 2016 numbers as of yet. This is annual numbers in the 2015 FBI column and annual numbers in the 2016 DPD column. The two columns to the left are columns that compare 2017 and 2016 year to date. For annual violent crime clearances, our target is 50% and property crime clearance is 23%. Homicide clearance rate information, our homicide clearance rate was 40% at the end of June, which is the official end of the quarter. However, currently for 2017, our clearance rate has risen to 75% with only four open homicide cases. Priority one calls for service. Our target for response is 5.8 minutes, average response time. The average response time was 6.1 minutes. Better than the same period in 2016, only by a few points, it was 6.25 as the average. Our target of responding to 57% of priority one calls is under five minutes. 52.6% were under five minutes. Improvement over the same period in 2016. We've developed supplemental patrols by utilizing investigators for, to fill one week tours in the field and to increase the number of patrol officers answering calls for service. We have consulted professional assistants to begin a study on beat realignment and calls for service based on the geographical makeup and population growth in the city. The results will help guide us in decisions regarding current beat structure and resource deployment. The new P2C, which is Police to Citizen Portal, is now in use and generated 73 reports in April, 78 reports in May, 56 reports in June, and 42 reports in July. These were numbers where our officers did not have to respond to the call and individuals were able to file a report through the automated system. Staffing levels. There were 53 sworn vacancies at the end of the second quarter. There are currently 28 vacant positions. 16 new recruit, recruits graduated, BLET, 45 
BLET 45 Academy and six recruits graduated from the ALET, which is our lateral program in July. The BLET 46 Academy, which currently has 34 recruits in training, started on August 8th. <clears throat> the number of recruit applicants increased by 63% comparing the first six months in 2016 to the same period in 2017. 132 applicants in 16 as opposed to 215 applicants in 2017. There were 18 non-sworn vacancies at the end of the second quarter. There are currently 21 non-sworn vacancies, 83% staffing at present. As of July 1st, the end of the second quarter, we had 297 body worn cameras that were actually issued to officers. At that time, cameras were issued to all patrol, including TAC, motors, bike patrols, K-9, our slide squads, watch commanders, desk officers, captains, and lieutenants. All officers attend a training class when cameras are issued to them. To date, 409 cameras have been issued since July 1st. Cameras have been issued to our set teams, internal affairs, our intelligence officers, training, and BLET. Training and issuance is ongoing through September for investigators and other units, including the Community Services Division. We've instituted an auto-tagging pilot project which began on June 1st, which means officers' recordings for dispatched calls will automatically be tagged. This feature is now ready for full departmental deployment and is scheduled for August 30th. Auto tagging also improves efficiency for officers by eliminating the task of tagging every video during or after their shift. The automated tagging happens as the officer is working. Second quarter community events. Durham Police Department participated in num numerous community activities during the second quarter, 2017. Here's a small sample of some of those activities. Many more are listed in your accompanying uh, second quarter written report. District one liaison officer, Terry Jennifer, organized a successful multi-agency Franklin Village Safety Day on June 24th in June Sergeant Somerville and his officers from Squad 4B held an Ice Pops with the Cops event in the Cornwallis Road housing community. They handed out more than 100 Ice Pops and got to know the residents a little better. On June 2nd, DPD employees and Durham residents gathered at Durham Police Headquarters to recognize National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Participants wore orange and the DPD headquarters building was bathed in orange light to bring awareness to the issue of gun violence in our city. Our PAL program added swing PALs this summer for middle school students in our PAL program to learn how to play golf. DPD officers assisted with the program. Our K-9 unit participated in the APS Walk for the Animals in May, and Assistant Chief Rose served as a judge for several contests. The Durham Police Department team was one of the top fundraisers. Commanders, officers, and other supporters of District 4, Lunch in the Mac, continue to engage residents and make inroads towards sustainable relationships. The Police Athletic League remains involved with local youth as we partner with other youth development advocates. And that ends my report. Thank you, Chief. Uh, let me ask so there are questions by members of the council. I recognize Councilman Shul, Councilman Davis, Councilman Moffitt. <coughs> Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Chief. Thank um, you. Always you do a great job with the report. A uh, couple of questions. The ALET, you said we had six people. Uh, do, do you, that's our first academy, I believe. The ALET. That's the first time in probably a few years that we've done a, a lateral program, yes. How do you feel about its success? 
I feel really good about it. I've personally met those individuals when they were first brought on before they even went to school, had an opportunity to have some one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. And I felt pretty good about uh, the first five that I met. Another one, another um, officer joined them later. But we make sure that even though we have laterals, we make sure that they come with uh, stellar backgrounds from their agency. Right. So I felt pretty good about them. Good. Yeah. And you mentioned the, uh, the number of people, the, the, the increase in applicants that we've had for the BLET. Yes. And is that mainly because the fact that the, uh, the pay is better? Is that the thing that's driving it? Or are there other things as well? I think it's a combination of things. Uh, we've instituted a very robust uh, recruitment campaign, but with that campaign came the various incentives that were granted, the, um, of course, the increase in salary and, um, you know, different incentives to take home vehicles, um, training opportunities. Um, I, I think it's been a combination, but the recruitment campaign has been very robust. Right. Yes. Well, it's really great to see the increase in the numbers. That's fantastic. Of course, that's going to increase the quality of our officers and our ability to get the number of officers that we want on the street. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the, what did you, how did, what did you, how are you feeling about the misdemeanor diversion court in the, uh, you didn't refer to it in this presentation, but in the, your larger presentation, you had the, uh, the numbers for that. And I thought that they looked very encouraging, but I was wondering what your impression of that was and how, I, my, my other question about that is, how are our officers responding to that? Are they responding favorably to it? Uh, and I'm just am interested in your impressions of how things are going. I think they're I think they're feeling very favorable about it. Actually, I think the process has become more normalized once they identify youth that meet certain criteria. It's, it's a policy now that that individual uh, qualifies for the misdemeanor diversion program. And I think that's why our numbers um, are seen as, as increase. And I was quite impressed at the numbers too. Not just the numbers for our youth, but the numbers uh, between the ages, I think 18 and 20, yes. had increased significantly as well, which means that these aren't encounters in schools. These are encounters that the officers are having just on the street and they're taking it upon themselves to allow individuals to go into the misdemeanor diversion program. Right. And so, and do you think that the officers themselves are pleased about this opportunity or do you think that it is something that um, they do reluctantly? I'm, I'm trying to gauge the support in, in terms of the rank and file and uh, you know, what, do you, what do you think about that? I, I think the officers uh, feel that this is a great opportunity for young people who have never, especially young people who've never had a brush with the law. Many of our officers have teenagers of their own and this program gives young people, young adults an opportunity to have a mistake and still um, not have that mistake keep them from being productive in their lives. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, um, the body-worn cameras and uh, the training that's going on, uh, does that include the office, is there, are officers trained to let residents know that the camera is on? Yes, and actually, I, I don't know if you remember after um, my last presentation we talked about yes, the short survey we did. Mm -hmm. And as a result of the survey, we began to do retraining, uh, primarily focusing on that issue and roll call. So supervisors are constantly reminding our officers as well to ensure that citizens know that the camera is on. Right. I continue to think that's really important and very much appreciate you including that in the training. I will have one more question. It'll take me one second to get to it in the report. It's the part two offenses. Um, the drug violations have dropped in half, which is good uh, for the January to June period uh, from last year. I'm, I'm assuming that doesn't mean that there are less violations. I'm assuming that means that we're handling them in some different way. I wondered if you could shed some light on that. I'm, well, on page, I'm on page eight, Chief, uh, uh, part two, drug violations. There okay. were 606 in 2016, and there are 302 in 2017. Well, and we've noticed the um, shift in drug violations as well. 
And, um, you know, I think it may have a lot to do with the manner of deployment, you know, um, our focus on various types of cases, the various um, diversion programs that exist as well. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if my team has any. Did I hit it, guys? They're looking at like, yep. <laughs> but, um, and, and we do believe that that might have a lot to do with um, the numbers shifting. Well, I'll say that I, I think that that's a positive development, uh, that I think we are, all know that, but I don't think it can be repeated too many times, that the, the criminalization of small acts is something we do want to try to avoid if there are other ways of handling them. And so I'm appreciative of that and also appreciative of the priorities that you have set. Uh, so thank you very much, and thank you for a good report. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Davis. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Chief, uh, thank you for your report. Um, I don't have questions necessarily, but I would like to uh, comment on several things that you all have done well. Um, I appreciate the National Night Out and all of the activities that went on in a community fashion. I thought that went well to establish good um, police and community relations. I also attended the uh, recent graduation of one of the um, groups of people who are now sworn officers. Uh, and I appreciate not only the people who graduated, but also the fact that you had the next class out there helping to usher and to do things along the way. Absolutely. I thought it was a good way of trying to make sure that we continue to do some recruitment. Um, and finally, I want to thank your department as well as the sheriff's department for the, for the way you all handle the recent challenges that we've had here in the community with the uh, large mobilization of people who are um, understandably concerned about issues of equity and fairness and um, uh, some of the things that went on in other places and the way we've tried to handle things here. Um, I, th I think the restraint that the department showed was good, but also when it was time for that march to end, then it needed to end. And I appreciate the restraint that was shown there, but also the um, manner in which you let people know that the um, First Amendment rights that they had dealt with had been utilized enough and it was time to go home. So thank you for the way that that was handled. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. I just wanted to uh, make the same. I, I'm, I'll pass because um, Councilman Davis made the comments I wanted to make regarding recent events. Thank you. Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. I will pass too, except I do have to say thank you. And I know that the city of Fayetteville is trying to copy us by bringing <laughs> somebody from Atlanta <laughs> to lead their department as well. Thank you for all you're doing and the, and the, and the, she, she's the department. She's a partner chief for them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I am just in awe of all the department is doing in the community to build um, stronger ties with the community. And I thank you for your leadership. Thank you, ma'am. Chief, I have, uh, I was, I attended a leadership conference of mayors a couple of weeks ago and I, sent a note to the manager and he sensed it said, respond to my question. But the number one, well, none, I shouldn't say the number, one of the priorities and concerns that was raised was this whole issue of opioids. Yes. And I was talking to mayors uh, at the conference and I said, you know, I, I just haven't heard that in Durham uh, to the extent that, uh, and these are, the, uh, you know, mayors from Chicago, Austin, this is all, all across the country. And, uh, I hadn't heard that in Durham. And I don't know if you might have a comment as to what level of opioid usage do we have in this community and how you, you're handling it. And if it's not as high as I've been led to believe, what, what do you attribute that to? Well, we have certainly been leaning forward trying to see whether or not that problem is proliferating in our community. And we just not, have not seen it at, at that scale. And um, typically, the opiate problem is seen in rural counties, um, you know, and, and might be making its way into some urban areas, too. 
but we've been fortunate that we have not seen instances of opiate abuse. Doesn't mean that it may not be happening, uh, but it just hasn't risen to the level where, where we think that that is a serious problem here in Durham at all. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief, um, one other thing. Um, I just want to say that um, we're all concerned about the possibility that the KKK or some light group could come to Durham. We know that's always a possibility. And <clears throat> I, I know that you all are thinking about how to prepare for that. And um, I, I guess I, I'm not asking you to say what your preparations are. Uh, but uh, could you just comment a little bit on your level of concern and, um, you know, how you all are thinking about that? Well, I think, you know, as a community, we're all concerned when a hate group comes to our town that could potentially incite a response. In law enforcement, we weigh heavily on intelligence because... Um, typically, when something is planned, there, there's some chatter about it. So we have paid very close attention to the intelligence, not just from our area, but intelligence that federal entities, you know, send our way. Uh, I believe that the Durham Police Department is equipped and prepared to deal with any type of unrest in the city. Our officers are well trained to deal with it. It is a complicated situation that you can't have an action plan for because your action plan is constantly evolving based on the scenario and the situation that you're confronted with. So um, I, I have all the confidence in the world in the Durham Police Department. And recently uh, I have talked with the uh, Sheriff's Department as well about uh, collaborating on how we address collectively those types of situations with public safety in mind first. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also want to just offer one observation. <clears throat> Excuse me. This really has as much to do with uh, the city manager's office as it does the police department, also to the sheriff's department. But I felt like on Friday, so... We all know there were lots of rumors circulating on the internet and everywhere. Uh, and I, I, I want us to think about how to put out, if we can, more quickly some of the facts that we know, because I think it could have helped us uh, on, on Friday. There was a lot of <coughs> unhappiness, upsetness, confusion, rumors. And um, so I just want to put that out there also for you, Beverly, to think about. I, I, I'm not sure, you know, I, I don't know. I know it's hard to respond in those circumstances, but I think insofar as we can give people the facts on a, on a current basis, so, you know, I'll, I'll just give you one example, which is that uh, in the afternoon, um, there were lots of rumors swirling around that the KKK had been given a permit to march. We know that's not true. But I got a lot of emails instantaneously saying, will you, will you revoke the, well, I couldn't anyway, but will you all revoke the permit for the KKK? And of course, I had to call around and say, is there a permit for the KKK? I mean, I knew there wasn't, but you have to check that out. And so then, you know, I was responding to these people. Maybe you all were responding as well. We and were. I'm, and we I'm were. just not aware of it. We so. were. Yeah. Early on, we were responding that there were no permits, and we sent it out to the media as well in hopes, and there was no other information to send. Yeah. Only that this was sort of a, a rumor or information that yeah. got out and took a life of its own. But the only um, thing that we could do was send out something basically saying we had no information about any event occurring in the city, there were no permits by the KKK or um, any other group that had been applied for um, with us or even with the county. 
So, um, so we'll so continue to we'll continue to work on that because you're you're absolutely right. Um, information so, so has that, a domino so effect. Yeah, and so good. I mean, I'm glad this was out, but I didn't. I, I would getting my information by calling the manager. Uh, you know, hearing what Charlie said. You know, so somehow I think we've got to figure out how to more widely disseminate it so that we can put out some of these fires. Again, I don't I don't have the answer to it, but I do think it's something we ought to continue to. Absolutely, do. Steve. Let, let, let me see. I, I wasn't going to to get into this. Um, you raised it, and I, I think I need to speak to it. I, I think we, as elected officials, have a personal responsibility in terms of what we say and don't say and how we say it on social media. Uh, we have a personal, and I don't do Facebook, I don't do Instagram, I don't do Twitter. I mean, I'm backwards, I understand that. But I can tell you that uh, we, as, as elected officials, have got to be more responsible, in my opinion, how we use social media when it comes to instances such as this. Uh, I came into the meeting probably about 10 o'clock, I guess when I got in, when the city manager was there, the, the police chief, the sheriff, uh, the staff, the county manager, and et cetera. And the first question I asked, have any permits been given for, for March? And they said, no, none at all. Uh, I was on WRAL, and that was one of the first things that I spoke to because people asked that question. But I think we have got to look at ourselves in terms of what we do in this social media piece and how we spread things, whether they're rumors, facts, or whatever. And it doesn't help when, when some of the things that occurred were occurring on that day. And I'm not pointing fingers. I can just tell you that was a problem, too. And we need to understand that. In fact, at some point in time, I'm going to ask that we have a meeting to really talk about how we police ourselves on the social media issue when it comes to issues such as we had this past weekend. And I'll leave it at that. But uh, we do have a responsibility ourselves to how, how we communicate in the form of community. Recognize city manager. Mr. Mayor, I don't want to pile on, but I, I can't miss the opportunity as well. Uh, you know, as Chief Davis said, and, and we've said, we, we responded to countless, I can't count how many times we were asked the question by the media, by the public, by any number of people with the same answer. People didn't want to believe it. They wanted to believe what they wanted to believe. Mm -hmm. And what I've told a number of people, and I've told some of you, that I would just hope that you would have enough confidence in us that if we would have issued a permit, you would have known it and you'd have never had to doubt to call mm -hmm. because you would have had confidence that we would have already told you. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully someday we can get to that point again. I thought we were there, but as of Friday, uh, I guess we weren't there. Thank you. Right. Mr. I recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yeah, uh, two things, very briefly. Uh, the first is, is that um, one of the things that every citizen, every resident can do to peaceful protest is leave the weapons at home. So I just want to make the, the plea on the dais, mixing weapons and, and um, emotions is a really bad idea. And um, peaceful, it, Durham should be a place where everyone can come and speak their mind peacefully. And, um, but it is, uh, but I plead that people leave the weapons at home. Um, and the second thing I wanted to do, I did want to go back and just, I did want to add my thanks. Uh, I felt like the department, um, it's been a long week. The department acted with great restraint. Um, at times, uh, people have questioned that to me. Um, and I have defended the department because I felt like the decisions that you um, and your command staff and your officers made uh, helped keep the, um, the volatility of the situation to a, to a minimum. And I know it was, uh, Friday was a particularly long day, um, but I just thought that um, the decisions that were made were um, that the fact that in, in the course of the entire week, we had one statue that was destroyed no other property damage, and as far as I know, no personal injuries. And I think that's a great record. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, we've been sort of proactive on the social media piece. We are having a meeting uh, in the next week or so to deal with that issue. That's the council uh, procedures. Yes. This meeting, I understand. 
Okay, Chief, again, we appreciate Thank you. your Thank you. support and appreciate what you do for the, for the community. Uh, we'll move now to the uh, public hearing matters, and uh, the manager's priority is requested that we move item 19 to the top, which is the public hearing to considering adopting a resolution rescinding six previously ordered petition utility improvements. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this is a uh, public hearing uh, that is a continued public hearing. I believe this will be the second or third time uh, that this public hearing is uh, being considered, as you indicated, to consider adopting a resolution rescinding six previously ordered petition utility improvements. And as you'll recall, uh, one of the major uh, uh, situations that uh, was impacting the, the this consideration were some fairly extensive uh, regulations that the uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation was imposing on uh, the roadways uh, related to these improvements that was really driving up the costs. At the last uh, time this was heard, uh, there was a, a request that we tried to meet with the department and uh, have a more engaged conversation around these, uh, these requirements. Uh, an initial meeting did occur uh, several weeks ago. I'm happy to report that uh, we feel fairly positive that there may be some movement that could result in a reduction in overall costs associated with uh, some or all of these utility improvements. And uh, as a result of that, uh, my recommendation would be that the, um, the council go ahead and, and uh, reopen this public hearing. Certainly, if you want to take uh, public comment, again, that is your prerogative. But then at the, uh, the end, close the public hearing and refer the matter back to the staff so that we can continue uh, proactive discussions with the uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation. And then uh, as the, uh, those discussions come to uh, fruition one way or the other, uh, we will uh, restart these processes and bring you back uh, information uh, for your consideration. i am be happy to answer any questions. Let me ask other questions. This is a continuation of the public hearing. What are the questions on the manager's comments? Recognize Councilman Moffitt first. Thank you. Not a question. I just, I know there are people here to speak on it. Um, and I know this has been a long time working through the process, but we're, um, I think the staff is really working to try to get to the possibility that um, answers will be um, more favorable. So anybody that wants to speak tonight, certainly we're here to listen. But um, I, I intend to follow the manager's recommendation and move to send it back to staff. Thank you. Any other comments by members of the council? I don't have anyone that has signed up specifically to speak on this item. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? Uh, so again, this is a public hearing, and if there are those who wish to speak at this time, uh, I invite you to, to the podium to the right if you state your name and address on, on the subject. So again, is there anyone in the public that wants, no, go ahead, that wants to speak on this item? And I, I should have, I would remiss in not saying, we, we did notify all of the uh, the, the people from the, that have uh, participated to let them know about this recommendation in advance. I think that may be why no one's here this evening. All right. In that case, let the record reflect that no one else asked okay. to speak on this item. Uh, I'll declare the public hearing to be closed and matters back before the council. You have a recommendation from the city manager to entertain a motion on your recommendation. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We now go back to the top of the public hearing items, uh, that being item 14, Unified Development Ordinance, Text Amendment, Omnibus Changes to Changes 10, 10 changes. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, Michael Sock with the Planning Department. And before I begin, I would like to state that the required notifications for all the planning uh, department related public hearing items tonight uh, have been performed per state and UDO requirements and are on file. Uh, text Amendment TC 17 -0001 proposes technical revisions and minor policy changes to various provisions of the Unified Development Ordinance. The amendments are identified as necessary corrections, clarifications, reorganization, or other minor changes to more accurately comply with the intent of the regulations, uh, codify interpretations of regulations, or reflect minor policy changes that are not solely technical in nature. Uh, details have been provided within the memo as part of your agenda packet. Uh, the JCCPC did review a draft of the amendment at its April meeting, and the Planning Commission recommended approval 12 to 1 at its May meeting. Board of Commissioners approved uh, this amendment without modification at its August 14th meeting. 
Uh, as a reminder, the Commission will be required to take two actions. The first action will be a vote on the appropriate statement of consistency, which is attachment B in your agenda packet. And the second action will be a vote on the ordinance amending the UDO itself, uh, found in attachment A of your agenda packet. Uh, thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report. I would ask first for the comments, questions by members of the council on the staff report. Uh, is there anyone in the public that wants to speak on this item? Again, this is a public hearing on item 14, Unified Development Ordinance, Text Amendments, Ominous Changes 10. Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the public has to speak on this item. I will declare the public hearing to be closed. The matter is back before the council. Move the consistency statement, Mr. Mayor. Second. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. I'll move the item, Mr. Mayor. Second. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you. We'll move to item 15. Item 15 is the Holloway Street Local Historic District Overlay Expansion and Preservation Plan Amendment. Thank you again. Uh, oh. Sorry, um, not used to speaking at this part of the uh, uh, meeting room. Um, Michael Stocking again with the Planning Department. Um, before you tonight is the public hearing for the Holloway Street ex uh, Local Historic District Expansion and Preservation Plan Update, uh, X10003. Uh, and um, we'd like to just walk the council through um, very concisely as possible uh, the aspects of the request since it's a more unique uh, type of zoning request that. Um, that you uh, versus what you normally see. And just a little background, um, this petition was submitted. Uh, it was a privately initiated uh, petition by uh, residents of the neighborhood, of the Holloway Street neighborhood back in 2010. And it was back at, per UDO requirements. It was reviewed by the Historic Preservation Commission and which approved initiating the district expansion. Uh, staff at that time from 2010 to 2013 uh, conducted additional research and held uh, numerous public meetings. And then in 2013, the adoption process actually began, uh, going through the first the HPC, which recommended approval, and then the Planning Commission, which recommended denial with a 6-6 vote. And this was back in 2013 when it was coming forward to City Council. City Council referred the item back to staff uh, for more uh, discussion about the boundaries uh, for the district. Um, one, so skipping ahead to 2016, uh, the consolidated review criteria was adopted in February 2016, and that was one of the uh, holdup factors for uh, why it went from 2013 to 2016. Um, not only did council ask us to take another look at it back in 2013 at, in, at the request itself, but at that time, the uh, and you might be aware, remember this, back in February 2016, council adopted the consolidated review criteria for all the historic districts, and that was just getting going back in 2013, and it was determined to be uh, prudent to wait for this process to finish before, and so for those who were considering being in the expansion area to know what the rules were uh, that they would be playing by instead of it being kind of iffy as they were going through the process. And unfortunately, it did take longer than was anticipated, but as soon as that was adopted in February, we got back on this project. And in March and April of 2016, we did outreach to the neighborhood. We held a public meeting and actually did uh, uh, self-addressed stamped envelopes that was born out of that uh, March meeting, uh, surveying all the residents in that area to see what kind of support there still was because there was a, such a time lag between 2013 and then. Um, the results, and I'll have a map for you in a minute, uh, the results were kind of mixed and thus staff at that time determined that it was just prudent to move forward with the process as, as the application was initially submitted. August and October 2016 had additional public meetings where we kind of again went over what it meant to be in a historic district taking a look at boundaries and any other issues that were being brought up. Uh, and then December 2016, an information item was presented to the Historic Preservation Commission before their uh, actual hearing. Uh, and also you had the State Historic Preservation Office review and comments, which are in your agenda packet. Uh, this was a survey, just a map of the survey responses from that March and April outreach. 
and actually into May. And you can see it was a roughly around a 50-50 in terms of those who responded uh, support and not support. There were a number that actually we just didn't hear from at all. But um, based upon this information, we, uh, the department decided that it was just prudent to move forward with the process and have a, a final conclusion to the project, mm -hmm. to the request. Um, this is just a map and focusing on uh, the request of 2010, the highlighted area, the shaded hatched area is the actual petition itself. And then when staff did its analysis of the boundaries and took a look um, at the petition, um, we came up with a couple other areas for additional consideration and those have also been notified through the public hearing process so they're up for rezoning. Um, there were four areas of consideration um, and they're highlighted there, one, two, three, four. Um, I'm gonna briefly uh, just mention what those four areas are. Uh, the first area, number one, are, is, um, oops, sorry, uh, the Queen and Elliott Street parcels, 601 and 603 North Queen Street. Uh, those, the houses that were there, uh, and I should back up, the petition mimics the actual National Historic District that's uh, applied to that area uh, back, established back in 2009. So there were houses on these two parcels back when the National Historic District was established. Those two houses were moved. So these, these, this, these, those two parcels that you see in yellow plus all the other parcels on that block are vacant. Mm -hmm. um, so the consideration is uh, to, and actually the suggestion from the State Historic Preservation Office was to remove those two parcels from the uh, boundary consideration. And that is actually before you tonight to not include those two. Those two, parcel, those two uh, houses were moved to the Gurley Street parcels that you see in blue. There's actually five parcels there, but along Gurley Street, uh, two, those two houses were moved there. They were considered consider, uh, contributing structures to the neighborhood. Uh, there, was also, there was a house there. Additionally, I believe at 513, um, it's detailed in your memo, um, and there was a vacant on the the most uh, southern portion there, parcel there, uh, is vacant, but there's actually a house under construction there um, as we speak, but it's basically a vacant site. The two properties along Mallard, uh, the corner property there is actually a city property and is vacant. Um, the one in from the corner there is actually a house that was moved from Swift Avenue. It was a Duke University uh, property, and it is a house that is a um, bungalow style house that is very consistent with a number of the houses within the neighborhood. And that was actually moved there in 2013 uh, of all time. So it wasn't captured when it first came, when it went through the original approval process. And those are the houses there. Uh, I believe uh, six, 513 and 603 were the ones that moved. 601 was already there. And then another parcel there was vacant. Um, area number three, Oakwood and Carlton parcels. <clears throat> those are under consideration also for addition to the boundary. Uh, they are the, the Carlton parcel, the smaller of the two parcels is vacant. The one uh, at 312 Oakwood, uh, it's new construction. Uh, that is being considered mainly for completeness of context of the area along the street so the district boundary doesn't stop <coughs> in the middle of the street. And then the fourth is actually a request to just move the boundary up to remove uh, the green area from that parcel. Uh, that parcel, it's covering just a portion of 208 North Elizabeth Street. Uh, it is a apartment complex, a non-contributing apartment complex, and, there, and within the motion tonight, we're just to move the boundaries, to move to the southern boundaries of those parcels along Holloway. Uh, again, this map mimics the map that is in your agenda packet. It, it's just a map of indicating the significant properties that would be considered significant. Um, one property uh, that, re there is one property, uh, 503 uh, Oakwood, that recently went through subdivision, and uh, I'll bring this up again, but that property uh, is now 503 and 505 Oakwood, and any motion tonight, we would ask that you include 505 Oakwood in there, and we can make amendments to the preservation plan, but that was just recently subdivided, so it isn't reflected in the preservation plan. I'm sorry, would you repeat that? Sure, that Oakwood. Oakwood is in the preservation plan. It just went through a subdivision not too long ago. 
So it's now 503, and the resulting parcel from it is 505 Oakwood. It would be a vacant parcel. It would be considered non con I'll back up for a second. Um, it would be considered a non-contributing parcel. We just want to make that aware of that and on the record. And any motion, we would ask that it would be, if, if it is approved, to include that parcel in there. Is 503 in the existing district? No, it's in the, it's in the expansion area. OK, so. It just wasn't when we updated. So oh, if we create an expansion area. We, yeah, and we will make that adjust, adjustment. Um, this is just, we made this um, map just as a result of the HPC meeting uh, back in January. Uh, these are just a map of the property owners who came out at the HPC meeting. There were uh, four property owners who, who came out in opposition to the request. And that was just a map of those who have spoke, spoken out against it. In addition, and these folks actually, a uh, number of these properties mimicked the ones from the survey response in opposition. Um, summary of the recommendations. Uh, the HPC recommended approval seven to zero. Uh, they were focusing on the merits of the historic district itself. And they did recognize that there was uh, neighborhood opposition for it and uh, didn't feel, felt that there were other bodies better prepared to handle those issues and they focused more on the merits of the historic district itself. Um, the May Planning Commission hearing was held and they recommended denial 11 to 2. Michael, could you clarify what that denial meant and if it was related to all four areas or any particular? It was related to, it was a, the motion actually wound up being a, mod, so what's before you tonight is the consideration of those four areas, uh, removing those two parcels in area number one, adding those parcels in two and three, and then removing the existing <coughs> Um That motion that they made, um, they had a lot of conundrum over how to make a motion based upon the information they were receiving. And it resulted in a, uh, it, it included some of those areas. It pulled, the motion pulled out additional parcels that weren't technically pointed out by the planning department, but they have a right to do as council does tonight. Um, so it was a, a mixture of that, and it was just a flat out denial 11 to 2. So could you clarify, excuse me, sir, could you clarify in terms of the uh, the action the council would take tonight? If the council, if you'd recommend the council take action on each of those items individually or they, they can, they're all, they're all up, it's all, they've all been properly notified, they're all included in the rezoning. Um, and it probably would behoove you to, if there is a wish to create some sort of historic district, to take a look, take a look at it in parts. If there's a motion to say, just not do the expansion and maybe just remove that designation in area number four and do a technical updates, that could also be a motion too. And then one more question to clarify, the, uh, the examples you gave, did not include, um, look, look to not include uh, the adjoining uh, public rights of way. And so in terms of defining the boundaries, uh, do they include the- They uh, would include to the center line of the rights of way. So even though the pictures didn't show that they were included, they because they were just showing the parcels, they would be included right. in the district. And that's standard for any of the zoning. Right. I just want to clarify from board. the picture. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Manager. I was going to ask the same question, maybe not extent you had, what does denial mean? Denying what? That's what this is what's clear to me. Okay, uh, look, you've completed. And the only other thing I want to say that staff had made a determination that the request would be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Thank you. Let me first ask other questions, comments by members of the council on the staff report. Uh, if not, then we have several people that have signed up to speak. Uh, I have one, two, three, four. Five, six proponents. And I want to make sure it's proponents of what. And I have one, two, three, four opponents. So let me call the names, and each person has three minutes to speak. And I will, that's 18 minutes for the proponents. And the opponents. Uh, we'll have four minutes each to speak. Uh, having said that, uh, Natalie Spring, if you come to the podium to the right, Natalie Spring, Alicia Trot, Tiffany 
Graves, Ron, Emerson, Heath, Reth, I can't get the last name, maybe you can see that. Susan Sain. Sain. Is there anyone's name that I did not call that is a proponent of general business agenda item number 15? If not, Okay, we can just line up behind uh, persons that are there. <laughs> Thank you. We know somebody's got a vote. Go ahead. <laughs> my vote's fake. Uh, hi, my name is Allison Trott, um, and I am a longtime Durham resident. I'm actually born and raised here, and the uh, parcel number three that's looking to be added. I'm to sorry, could you just stick, give your name and address, please? Yes, um, Allison Trott, and I live at 312 Oakwood. Uh, which is actually parcel number three in this picture. Um, so that's the lots that were vacant, but I have built a very modern looking home on them and live there now. Um, I grew up in Durham. I'm a longtime Durham resident. I love this town and I very much want to stay here and plan on it. Um, and I am for the historic district. I've, I've read through it very carefully and I feel that it does a lot to um, keep the feel of the neighborhood uh, it's a lot like the neighborhoods that I grew up in, and I came over here because of that. Um, and there's a lot of those elements that I think could very easily be moved out if um, they aren't protected in some way. And so I'm, I'm a proponent of the historic district. I think it's um, a good thing. And we built the house around having a historic district. So we planned for it because we were pretty sure it was going to pass when I bought the lots. <laughs> um, and so when we built, we built that way. And my builder was very clear um, that it would probably pass if it had been a historic preservation district. He actually knew a couple people on the, on the permit committee and talked to them about it in advance and after we built it. And they said that it would not have been an issue. So this kind of building could still take place even if the historic district did pass. Um, so that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a good night. My name is Natalie Spring. I live at 801 Cleveland Street, and I own a rental house at 503 North Queen Street. Uh, that's Mary Ann Hillary Spring, who's sitting with uh, Councilman Reese this afternoon. <laughs> um, I'm speaking in for in favor of the historic district. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk back and forth for seven years among neighbors, among outside developers, um, among people who very desperately love this area. And there are people who desperately love the area on both sides. Um, there are people who've lived here, you know, I've lived here for 16 years. There's people who've lived here double that on both sides. You know, it is a, it is a hard issue that's before you tonight. There isn't a really clear, yes, this is amazing, no, this isn't. And I just want to tell you why I'm for it. Um, Durham wants to be a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, and I think that Durham as a town has that ability to really care for and nurture growth in a way that benefits all people. Um, I don't think it has to be a us versus them, a new versus old, a historic versus modern. I think we can do all of those things, and we have an entire city in which we do those. So we have in our little village of Cleveland Holloway, we have massive, beautiful modern homes like Allison's, and we have massive, beautiful Victorian homes like mine. We also have 600 square foot houses, and we have 1,000 square foot houses. And what you're voting on today is not protect, protecting the fussy Victorians like mine. My fussy Victorian is already protected. I'm in the local district on Cleveland Street. What you're protecting are 1,000 square foot bungalows. They're 1,200 square feet, 1,000 square feet. Um, the planning department was talking about 503 Oakwood has been parceled off. What we're going to see because of the size of these lots is the 1,000 square foot houses going away and two, three, four, five thousand square foot houses being built in their place. Um, we can't stop gentrification in Durham. We can't stop the gentrification that's happening and happened in Cleveland Holloway, but we can make an affirmative statement 
that having a neighborhood right by downtown that has a mix of uses, that has a mix of housing options, is something that we as a city want. We want there to be condos downtown. We want there to be condos on Roxborough. We also want there to be 1,000 square foot houses, not just in Golden Belt. Golden Belt needs them, but Cleveland Holloway needs them too. And so if you want to stop the pressure that we'll see to remove those and make it downtown just for the rich, then you have the opportunity tonight to vote for the local historic district and to protect some of these smaller houses. Now, they're still expensive. I'm not going to, I don't want to mislead you. Those small houses are expensive, but a 1,000 square foot house is always going to be cheaper than a 5,000 square foot house, and we need a range in downtown. Thank you. Uh, I'm Heath Beckett. Um, I'm also speaking for the historic expansion. Um, I live at 705 Mallard Avenue, and I also have a house at 510 Carlton. Um, one of the things that kind of made me fall in love with Cleveland Holloway was that it had preserved its historic character, whereas a lot of other neighborhoods in Durham maybe haven't. Um, I, you can walk through and like you can just see the history, and it's living, and people are actually still using these structures. It's not like a museum. Um, in the past 12 months alone, I've seen three of these houses demolished and quickly, you know, a cookie cutter, like 3,000 square foot box is put up in this place. Um, in my opinion, if this expansion does not pass due to the rising uh, home costs and, you know, basically everything's just getting more expensive, uh, you're going to see a lot more of that in pretty much all of these historic homes that aren't 5,000 square foot Victorians are going to be demolished and they will become... Uh, these cookie gutter homes. So in my opinion, uh, I think that the history and the character of this neighborhood and of Durham itself is under attack. And I think that this is a way to prevent that. Um, thanks. You're welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm Tiffany Graves. Um, I live at 523 Holloway Street. Some of you may know me from another lead issue going on there. Um, that's another time. Um, I am for the historic expansion, um, and I have been since the beginning. Um, I live on Holloway Street. Uh, I am already protected, so I would, you know, defer to what more of the people inside the neighborhood would say. Um, I wanted to think back to the map that showed you the contributing and non-contributing -contrib structures to show you that these houses are truly historic and should be protected. And I believe today what you need is one day notice to knock those houses down. Um, and if this passes, I believe you would need a year notice. And I think it would preserve the houses that should be protected. Um, there's danger in this neighborhood um, of people being very concerned about density and not being concerned about the neighborhood. Um, we are, I am for density, a lot of us is, are for density, um, but not at the sake of the people who are living right next door in a, you know, thousand square foot house if you have to be right across the street from a massive structure that's built on an empty uh, plot. So this would help um, protect those neighbors from what could be next door. Um, the roads in the neighborhood can't hold a gigantic complex being built there. Um, Cleveland Holloway is just a special place. Um, I love it. Um, I don't necessarily not want it to change. Um, I do want density. Um, I do want to be modern. But I don't want the character taken. Um, and I do want uh, people to have to be thoughtful before they remove these houses and change the character of the neighborhood. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, but again, if you go back to that map showing you which homes are contributing, you'll see that this, I mean, it really is a historic neighborhood. So I think it should have that designation. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, my name is Susan Zhang. I live at 510 Carlton, and I wanted to speak today in favor of the local historic district. Um, I moved into Cleveland Holloway in 2013 when all this was already happening, and it's been ongoing since then. So I've been receiving many letters in the mail about this um, proposition. And 
I want to say, you know, when I, I'm an immigrant and I first moved to the United States at six, at six years old, and my parents always had an American dream of owning a house and having a backyard. They never achieved that dream. But when I purchased that 1,000 square foot bungalow, that tiny house, not a Victorian at all, built in 1920, the year my grandfather was born, it was me realizing the American dream. And the fact that I could afford it when so many of the houses now are being torn down at that size and a $400,000 house is going up in its place, something you see and carry that I could never afford, that for me shows we need to protect Cleveland Holloway and make sure it's still an affordable neighborhood where people can still buy a 1,000 square foot house, two bed, two bath, with a little yard, and have that historic preservation that makes Durham so special and not just Cary or Morrisville or any other place in North Carolina. Um, so I really please recommend that you think about how long this process is and what we want Durham to be in the future, even as we continue to grow. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Hello, uh, my name is Rob Emerson. I live at 1202 North Gregson Street in Durham, and I currently serve as president of the board of directors of Preservation Durham. I know it won't come as a huge surprise to any of you that Preservation Durham unequivocally supports the creation and expansion of this district. Um, we stood here um, about a year ago uh, with the residents of Golden Belt, and now we're standing with the residents of Cleveland Holloway, who initiated this uh, petition seven years ago, long before uh, the runaway development and gentrification had taken such a hold in their neighborhood. With this protection comes a little bit of added bureaucracy, but without it, we're much more likely to lose the diversity and character of this historic neighborhood. Much of the land within this proposed district boundary is zoned for multifamily development. Combined with its proximity to downtown and the value of the land relative to the small homes on them, we have a near perfect recipe for speculative development, teardowns, and overbuilding. Like any zoning action, the decision to designate a historic district is reversible. Demolition is not. Local districts offer the only mechanism I know of to prevent or delay the demolition of a historic building. On one hand, we're facing an affordability crisis, and we talk about stewardship of scarce national, natural resources and the desire to keep Durham dirty. On the other hand, we're bulldozing modest homes and commercial buildings of brick, stone, and old growth timber, a short walk or bike ride from downtown. We're replacing small homes and entrepreneurial spaces that were recently affordable to teachers and artists with bland buildings of inferior materials that only a few of us can afford. Where local district protections are not in place, we are losing not only the character of these early 20th century neighborhoods, but we're also losing the diversity that a wide variety of building types, shapes, and sizes promotes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jenny Tucker and I live at 707 North Queen Street. Um, I am here to speak in favor of the expansion and I will not um, speak too long simply because uh, the people who spoke before me did a wonderful job of articulating so many of my similar feelings as well. I can only speak personally in that I do live in one of the smaller homes uh, within the neighborhood and that um, I'll also reiterate that uh, something that someone else recently said, which was that everyone on both sides has both agreements and disagreements of this discussion and both for and against. And I will say the connective thread is a love and passion for this neighborhood, which I, I think um, is can echo really all of all of Dermites, which has made it such a wonderful home for myself. And then also personally, I will say that as an art historian, um, professionally, I have a particular interest in this expansion uh, simply because, in my mind, the most precious part of this is a pause for thought and a pause for a collective conversation on how best to both preserve uh, thoughtfully and carefully, um, which is mirroring uh, much of what is happening in the city at large. and. Um, I'd also like to say thank you so much for your time. I'm a neophyte here at the City Council, and it's been a thrilling experience. Um, <laughs> I mean, that bottom of my heart, I've loved it. So thank you all so much. Wow, that's an unusual sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> L 
let me ask, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item as a proponent that has not spoken? Uh, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak as a proponent. We will now move to those that are opposed, opponents. Uh, I have Mark Galifianakis, James Bradford, Chris Dickey, and Ram Netter. Now, is there anyone else that wants to speak in opposition to this proposal? If not, if you proceed to the podium to my right, I state your name and address. Good evening. My name is Mark Galifianakis. My address is 516 Polk Street. Um, if I can ask, um, Michael, would you mind putting up the map of the uh, responses to the neighborhood survey? That'd be, that'd be great. Um, my family, uh, my father grew up on uh, what is now called Mallard Avenue. It was Markham Street at the time. And uh, over the years, picked up a couple extra parcels. Uh, we will not be impacted by this directly, but indirectly. And I'm mainly here tonight supporting the folks who are opposed to it. Um, I think the two biggest points I want to make is this map right here pretty much tells the story. There's not unified support for it. There's not a majority of respondents who were in favor of it. But in fact, if you actually count up the parcels and include the um, undecideds, uh, more people are uh, against it than in favor of it. It's it's a very small majority, but it's it, but it is a majority. So that tells the story. The good thing is both the proponents and opponents uh, on this issue have all remained civil and uh, been able to get along and remain neighbors. Um, as you know, this has been going on since 2010. Um, there was a uh, petition filed to rezone this area to a local historic district overlay. And the, the signers of that petition, roughly half of them are, not, are now gone. So they're, they're no longer property owners or living in the neighborhood. And that's what got this whole ball of wax rolling. And today, um, you see results like this. So there's just not unified support for this like there have been in other cases. Um, and you know we've gone through and analyzed all the signatures from 2010, and and roughly half half the folks are still around and still property owners. In fact, um, Nat Natalie's close by, but no longer living in the rezone area. Uh, another important point I want to make is this is a rezoning, so it's it's it sounds um, like nothing comes along with it. You're going to get this local historic district label, but it is a burden to some folks, especially the longtime residents, the folks that have been there 30, 40, 50 years, the folks who are retired and on a fixed income. And although the city might not say, we're not gonna tell you what color you can paint your house or not paint your house, there is an application process. Someone's gotta come downtown and make application. They've gotta pay a fee. And that is a burden, especially for folks on fixed income. And things as simple as you know, someone needing a wheelchair ramp can't just go build it. You gotta come down. Nobody's gonna turn it down, but you still gotta come down here, file an application, and pay a fee. And so there is a cost involved. And if we're if we're worried about affordable housing, that needs to be taken into account too. That there there is a cost and there is a burden to property owners. And that's those are the two two main points I want to make. There's just there's just not enough support here to rezone a hundred and some properties um, where at least half the folks that are engaged aren't interested in it. And uh, that's it. And uh, if, I, if I may, I'd like to reserve a minute of time in case something pops up. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Good evening. James Bradford. I live at 7616 Herndon Road here in Durham. Um, I'm here to support the longtime residents of this neighborhood. Um, I bought my first property over there in this neighborhood in 84. So I've been there a long time. And there's a few people still live there <laughs> that was there when I first bought the property. Uh, um, and I know none of them who want this. Matter of fact, a few of them who signed the petition to start this, once they learn more about it, they signed a protest petition to get out of it because they don't want to have to come downtown and explain what they want to do. 
especially when neighborhood services comes in and say, you got to do this, this, this. And then someone else says, you have to do it this way. So, you know, I don't want to belabor this, but I just don't see why this is needed. You can go over there right now, and you'll see new construction, and you'll see rehab. There's not every house being torn down. There's a house on Queen Street right now, whole house jacked up in the air, people building a foundation to renovate it. They're putting tons of money to renovate it. So the idea that everything is going to be torn down, it's not true. I have a friend of mine on, on Oakwood also, no, Queen. He just finished a renovation. His house sold in two days. He did a great renovation. So renovation is happening. Some teardowns are happening. New things are being built. Everyone who I think spoke tonight, house is being protected by state law. They're still, they can apply for their credits. They can do all the things they want to do. They're still protected. So why do they need another level of protection? Why do the longtime residents need one other weapon against them? Thank you. Uh, members of council, Chris Stickey. I live at uh, 311 Oakwood and also 401 Oakwood. I apologize for my wife for not being here, but my son is working at the Durham Bowl Bar Park and she needs to give him a ride home once the game is over here. But uh, me and my family have been in this particular community since 1993 when it was unheard of to move to, to Cleveland and Holloway. Uh, during that time, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of people. A lot of people have moved. Gentrification has come in and moved, moved a lot of people out and brought a lot of people in. But I think the main thing that we're, we're, we're discussing here is if we look at factual. I mean, this, this process started back in 2010. And back in 2010, it got brought before council right around that area. And there were some questions at that particular time and moment in reference to the amount of support Council said, let's go back and see what you can do with the community to generate and garner support. That has not happened. You can see that this community is, although we're conciliatory towards one another, we, we are divided to a large extent. What this impacts to me is my family. Uh, my family owning two. I have a large Victorian home and I have a small home. I understand what it's taken to sort of rehab and revitalize. For me to go through that process through the if this is passed here, it would be very, very painful. But because I've worked, I mean, I work for the city, I understand how to circumvent that. But I also understand, as some of these folks have alluded to, there are a lot of people that have moved in this neighborhood that cannot be here or who don't even understand the process. That's who I'm representing here as well, is that these folks, a lot of retirement people, a lot of folks who don't really understand that. You had a lot of new folks who've, who've come to this particular area who voiced their opinion, and I humbly respect that. I do humbly respect that. But what I'm asking you to do is this here, is look at the facts. This does not have substantial community support. The commission denied this thing not once, but twice. Even the historic preservation committee that went through this, there was, when we were sitting there as the foreigners went before them, they had a problem with this as well. And basically, they want it documented in the minutes here that basically that this does not have substantial community support. So I guess what I'm asking from this particular from this particular council here, I know it's very tough. I know it's very passionate. I can say I've lived in that community in 1993. In my community, there has not been a lot of houses that have been knocked down. Most of the houses in that particular community that we're talking about here have been re-renovated. There's not a lot of brand new houses that are just going up, stick big houses that are going up. Yeah, one right across the street, but that house across the street that was torn down was torn down because it was condemned. And this young lady built a brand new, beautiful home there. Now, with that home where it exists right now, it's beautiful. Would that particular home move or go through the threshold there? I don't know, but it doesn't exactly fit, but I think it's a <laughs> wonderful improvement to our particular community. So I guess what I'm saying to you at council is this here. 
Affordability is gone. There is not affordability in that neighborhood anymore. $200,000, $225,000 for a shell is what's being cost. There's not affordability in Cleveland Holloway anymore. I think the facts here is this here, is that from an economic benefit as it relates to my family and some of the other things, it will be painful to me and my family. Thank you. Uh, thank you, members of council. My name is Ram Netta. Um, I live at 501 Oakwood Avenue on the corner of Oakwood and Ottawa in the very middle of the district that would be uh, in the very middle of the area that would be affected by the potential expansion. Um, although I'm not from this country, I've lived in Durham for 14 years and I've lived in Cleveland Holloway for five years and I was one of the signatories on the original petition in favor of the LHDO expansion. And I signed that petition in favor of the expansion for the reasons that um, Natalie Spring and Tiffany Graves very eloquently stated in their defense of the expansion. I can summarize very quickly why I changed my mind, which is that data from the National Bureau of Economic Research indicates that over a 10-year period, property that's inside a local historic district increases in value faster than property that's not. And so passing this expansion is exactly the wrong way to address what I take to be Durham's affordable housing problem, at least if you believe the data. Now, as a property owner in the affected district, if you decide to pass this expansion, I should say a big thank you because that's more money in my pocket. But the future, Susan Zhang, who wants to buy affordable property in that district is not going to be able to. So that's my reason for changing my mind from supporting the expansion to opposing it. So thank you for your time. Sir, can I ask him a quick question? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, sir. Ram Netta. Ram, Ram is Netta. like, uh, yeah, R-A-M, mm -hmm. and the last name is N E. T A. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, there are other persons that want to speak again. Uh, we've heard we're hearing from the opponents to this proposed change. Uh, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak either as an opponent or proponent of this item. I'm not going to close the public hearing yet, but I'm bringing the matter back before the council for comments that. Uh, my colleagues may have before I entertain a motion, before I close the, the hearing and then entertain a motion. I have a question. Recognize the mayor pro tem. Uh, good evening. Uh, being a, a long time resident of Durham, I'm really familiar with this area. And I wonder now what the demographics are in terms of age and, and race. I, I can remember when there were lots of seniors there. And I assume that there a lot of seniors still there. Can somebody answer that question for me? Uh, the, she's asked if you want to come forth and respond to her questions. And because I'm a, I, I have some concerns about uh, burdens on, on senior citizens. Um, so I'll speak from my experience that for the past five years, uh, me and Tiffany have been the organizers of the Christmas Eve carols to our elderly neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, and very sadly, our list of places we can carol grows smaller every year. Um, we have about six elderly residents right now who live on Mallard, Queen, Carleton, who are still in their houses that they own free and clear, that they've lived in since 65, 70. Um, but our elders are dying and their um, family members are encouraging them to leave, uh, sell the houses and move into places that are easier on their family members. There's a lot of deferred maintenance with our elderly neighbors. Um, we've had several who, without the local historic district, have had to move because they were cited by NIS. So NIS came in and said, your, your house isn't fit anymore. And so we've lost several neighbors that way as well in the past two or three years. 
Thank you uh, for that. I, I'm concerned still about uh, the stability of the neighborhood as it relates to um, the elderly still. I know of some elderly folk who live in that area, and I would hate to see cost burdens on them from escalating taxes. And um, as Mr. Bradford outlined, uh, if they needed um, a wheelchair ramp, they would have to come to City Hall and go through a burdensome process to make that happen. But I'm still listening to comments. Can I listen to Mr. Bradford, Mr. May? Sure. Okay. About the demographics and what I've seen and what I've seen, some of the people now, um, the older people who are still there or moving out are trying to pass it down to their kids. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, they don't have the money to do a full renovation, but they're there doing some fix up and this will hurt them. You know, they're giving it to their grandkids, you know, to members of their family or they have family members who live on the property that don't have anywhere else to go, that they're trying to keep it for them. And so when things happen where there's repair needed or neighborhood services comes in and say you have, you have to do certain things, it is additional burden on them to then have to go through another process. Have property taxes escalated there? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, that was a question. I many of them, knew the many of them have more than double. Mm -hmm. You know, we know. You know, you can just see it in the vacant land. If you own a vacant land, piece of land there, you know, it's tough on you. So mm -hmm. you can imagine. They look at. Sometimes I mad, I look at the house values from a tax standpoint, and it's. I hope they can get the money for that. And then there are area um, houses on the periphery mm -hmm. of that district that are suffering as well yes. because of the houses there. Yes. So we have to be mindful of them too. Yes. Thank you so much. Are there other questions or comments? Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, <clears throat> if I can get all this in. Um, first of all, I have a question for staff. And just a, just a curiosity here um, because of the obvious split in the neighborhood. When someone uh, files a petition for a new district like this, what's the threshold of percentage of properties that have to be represented? Um, back in, when this was done in 2010, I believe it was 25%, 25%. Is that different now? It, the process is different now. We don't specify a percent. The whole initiation process has changed. So okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I want to appreciate everyone who spent time up to seven years working on this, and, and especially people who came tonight, people who sent emails. Um, when I first got on council five years ago, this is one of the first things that people sought me out to talk about. This is actually sort of the second thing, but they, this is one of those that they sought me out to talk about. And they were people who were vigorously opposed to the idea of creating a district, which is one reason why we wound up sending it back to staff uh, four years ago. And um, I want to comment that I love the obvious mutual respect of those in favor and those against. It's very rare to disagree without rancor these days, and I commend all of you for the way that you're approaching this. Um, um, Rob Emerson from uh, Preservation Durham talked about Golden Belt. Um, that, pro that district, um, they worked, I, th I think, very hard to um, inform and get people on board and, and uh, no homeowner that I was aware of disagreed with the district at all. Um, I'm not in a district, but I live very near one, Watts Hospital, Hillendale, and likewise, they worked really hard and I doubt, I don't think anybody uh, spoke in opposition to it. I do have concerns about, um, I am leaning against approving an expansion of this district because I have concerns about the number of people who are clearly opposed and the burden, there's, there's pluses and minuses that have been pointed out, um, but the burden that it places on people who are not ready to accept those burdens. Um, and 
Um, so that's um, my leaning at this time. I look forward to hearing any other comments from my colleagues. Thank you for coming out. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, I guess a couple of things um, trouble me about what's being proposed. And I, I, I too want to compliment all of the persons that have spoken this evening. Uh, I understand well the persons who are for this, your rationale for it. I uh, understand those that are opposed to it. Uh, I, I guess the first thing that struck me, and Don sort of spoke to it, but um, the large number of persons that are in this area that are against it. That, that just, that's, that troubles me some, somewhat. The other piece is we just had a long discussion a couple of weeks ago about homeowners' property values having risen, and then with the tax rates that have been set by the city and county, their property taxes have gone up. And at least my focus was on those areas where the city had, through unintended consequences, revitalize some of those neighborhoods. And as a consequence, those homeowners below medium income that were in there had done nothing to their homes, had their property values increased. And we we're trying to find a way to, to mitigate against that. Almost see the same thing happening here. Here you have a, a district or a site or location where the city hasn't gone anything, gone in there and done anything to actually help revitalize that neighborhood. We haven't built any new houses. We haven't done anything like we did over on South Side. But I could very easily see how by imposing the historic district has been overlaid, it's been proposed here. <coughs> and I've heard people talk about how the property values have gone up. I could very easily see how some homeowners are saying, but not for you having done that. My values might not have gone up as much. I, I also have, have a concern for persons who talk about people selling their properties or being forced to sell their properties or because the, all the values are going up so high, people tend to, live up, tend to move. That's an individual decision. I mean, for African Americans in particular, probably the biggest asset that we have is in our homes is in our homes. And, you know, we tend to hold on to those homes as long as we can. We also hold on so we can pass them on to persons in our families. They appreciate, the value goes up. Maybe I don't need, want to be there anymore, so I move. I move. But what I see in this particular situation where you have the vast number of people who don't want it and then for whatever reason we come along and I shouldn't say for whatever reason, we make a decision to impose that overlay and in my opinion you negatively impact those persons who don't want it. They didn't ask for it. They weren't here tonight but the survey has been done and typically when we go through these zoning matters we tend to listen to the those that are for, those that are against, and try to rationale how we make the decision. So I, I just have a problem in supporting uh, putting an overlay on a large district as this, given the opposition that the survey says is there. But more importantly, the impact that I think it could have on those persons who haven't made any conscious effort to have their values rise, but they do rise, consequently their taxes rise, and you come back to the city and say, but not for what you've done, that wouldn't have happened. And to me, it puts us right back in this other situation that we were dealing with uh, a couple of weeks ago. I, I really appreciate what those that have made the investment in this area have done. I, I appreciate the fact that it's been sort of a cordial uh, yes, we support it. No, we don't support it. And somehow you still get along. But I, I just have problems, me personally, of supporting that type of a change for this large of a district 
with this many people who are opposed to it and the subsequent consequences that I think could occur for those persons who are living there and don't want to, don't want this uh, historic district uh, imposed upon their properties. I recognize Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, question for staff, do we have that actual um, vote totals when the um, current residents were polled on this? The map shows us some colors. I could try to count them, but I'm really old. We, we got around 40 some responses and they were generally, yeah, it was maybe 49, 51, one way or the other. I don't have the specific numbers, but it was pretty evenly split. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the materials that are attached to this agenda item include attachment number three, attachment A, uh, which is the original petition, is that correct? Yes. Are there pages that could be missing with other signatures on the petition, or is this what we've got? These are the people that actually signed the petition back in 2010. As far as I'm aware, this is, this is it. Okay. Um, Mr. Netta? Oh, okay. Um, I w just wanted to ask him uh, why his signature and uh, property address doesn't appear on the petition. That's all. Since he said he signed it, I just wanted, and that was pretty powerful uh, commentary, I thought, for all of us as someone who signed it and now wants to get out. But I'll, I'll maybe we'll have time to ask him that when he gets back in the room. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I thought he said he lived one place and had property in another place, but anyway. He definitely said he signed the petition. Yeah, 501 sure. Oakwood. Yep. That address is not listed in the petition, neither is his name. The original petition you're speaking about. I'm it's sorry. not listed on the original petition. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, since I've got the microphone, I'll go ahead and talk about the underlying uh, matter before us. <clears throat> um, I'm not 100% certain <clears throat> why this matter took so long to get to this stage in the process. Um, but I think it <clears throat> constitutes, well, I think seven years has to constitute a failure at some level. Um, and the failure is on the part of the city uh, to the folks who came to us with this petition in the first place. Um, I look at the materials before us. I took a look at the criteria that we use to determine whether or not these kinds of um, historic districts are appropriate. It seems to me um, that the district does have um, sufficient number of historically significant residential structures that warrant protection. Um, seems that, that protecting those structures um, is consistent with our comprehensive plan. Um, we have a petition before us that um, was the result of a lot of hard work um, and had the matter been uh, put forward in a more reasonable time frame, I think the, um, we would have a different situation before us uh, because I think the number of, uh, because I do think there are a number of historically significant residential structures in the area and because that is the purpose of this sort of district, I intend to uh, vote in favor of the staff recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, entertain other comments from, from the council? I, I'm going to close the public hearing. So I recognize all the council members who have comments. We want to make an assignment. If not, uh, I'm going to entertain a motion one way or another on, on this item uh, so we can. Staff. I'm sorry. I'm if, sorry. If, if I may, to help maybe guide in thinking about a motion, um, at a minimum, um, not knowing which way council is, is thinking. Um, but at a minimum, plan, uh, the planning department would like to see um, at least a motion to approve um, at a baseline tech, the technical updates to the preservation plan and possibly also the removal of the designation in area number four, if that's a baseline. Mm -hmm. And if, if there's gonna be just, you don't want the expansion or there's a vote not to do the expansion, that would be like just a baseline approval. And then obviously, you can do whatever else you want, but we would like at least that. <laughs> and we need to do the consistency statement as the first The one, consistency no statement would still okay. be first. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll second it. So I'll move that we approve the consistency statement. Second. 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 It's been properly moved. It's been properly moved and second. 
All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. I'll move that we remove the existing historic designation on 208 North Elizabeth Street, labeled as Area 4. Second. Can, can you state the address again? For 208 North Elizabeth Street. And do you want to also want to move the technical correct, the technical updates to the updates. preservation? Yes, and the technical updates to the preservation area. I'll second all that. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, and keep by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Um, so then I'll move that we expand the historic district as petitioned except for 601 and 603 North Queen Street properties identified as area one, and that we include the properties identified in area two and three in the expansion. Second that. It's been properly moved and second. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Recognize Council Mark. A point of clarification, there were additional properties that you talked about tonight, right, that are outside of one, two, three, and four? The only ones that we we raised to you were one, two, three, and four. Uh, there are others who brought up their own properties, uh, 311 uh, Oakwood, um, 501 Oakwood, but those but I, I in the areas of consideration were. Five lots on Gurley Street. Right, that's area two. Mm -hmm. Well. I'm sorry, the map in the, okay, there must be something. I have a different thing with different, the number two is on the corner of Ottawa and Oakwood. That'd be great, thank you. Okay, so what you're looking at, the hatched area, is that area as petitioned, and it actually does include the area as petitioned, did include area number one, and from what I understand from the, from Councilman Johnson's uh, additional uh, motion was to remove area one from that from the expansion. Area two is the Gurley Street and Mallard Street parcels. Uh, area three is uh, the Carl the one Carlton parcel and the Oakwood parcel 312 Oakwood. And number four is what you already removed from the uh, mm -hmm. from the uh, from the district designation. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that that's the staff recommendation is to exclude area one, include area two and area three. That's correct. Okay. Recognize there's a motion and a second and comment. Recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a hard decision, and I really appreciate everybody being here for it. I have been uh, really uh, torn about this and trying to figure it out. Uh, in the end, I do think that the danger of teardowns is, is, is very significant, and we're seeing it all over town in large single family, uh, very large single family dwellings going up, including in areas which are. Uh, uh, you know, historic districts, um, it can still happen, uh, but it does take longer. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, this do I, I understand uh, what people are saying about the fact that it can visit additional hardship on people. I, have, I live in a historic district. Uh, there are, uh, I've, I've recently, I don't know, a couple years ago, um, made a change to a foundation, simply replacing it with the similar materials. I did have to go downtown. It was instantly approved, but I can appreciate that that was easier for me than it is for some people. And I think Chris Dickey made that point. Um, I get that, and so I think it's a. It's this is a close call, uh, but I think that for me the trade-off is that I think the danger of the teardowns is is very real and significant. I think that we do want to be preserving our uh, our. You know, the the these are some of the most you know, th these are wonderful historic houses, and the Durham's, um, you know, so much of what's good about Durham is built on the attractiveness of our historical structures and the way we have used them. So uh, I'll be voting for this, uh, but I will say that uh, I appreciate the opponents. It, it is a very close call for me. Thank you. Steve, could I ask you a question on that, please? Sure. Um, you, you mentioned teardowns. So if I'm living in one of these structures, I own it, I've been there for however long, and I suddenly decided that I can't live there anymore. Uh, and I have an opportunity to sell the structure to allow me to move away or whatever. 
and I sell it to someone and they want to tear it down, you have a problem with that. I mean, that's, I, that, that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to understand. You, you have a problem that my structure, my house, that I've spent whatever time in it, kept it up as best I could, I now have an opportunity to attain some value out of it for personal reasons. And it so happens that the person I'm going to sell it to says, I don't want that. I, I want something else. And so you're going to deny me the opportunity to sell my house to this person who wants to tear it down because you don't like to see teardowns. Am I, am I missing something? Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, that's fine. That's why I asked yeah. the question. Well, I'll just give you my point of view. Okay. Um, so we have that situation in my neighborhood now. Mm -hmm. uh, you can sell your house, and if someone, it, it takes a year to tear it down, but you can still tear yeah, it down. Fine. Um, but I think that the, the, if you're living in this neighborhood and you want to sell your house and let's say you're living in a small, one of the small mm -hmm. bungalows that have been described, mm -hmm. those are, and you've been living there for a significant amount of time, you're still going to realize a very large, uh, you know, increase in value, uh, if you sell it simply for the use that it's, you know, that's, that's been made of it already. So... I don't think we're depriving people of the right to make a profit on their home, and I don't think it's any different than anything else, in, in, than any other of our historic districts, except maybe that it might be more favorable to you than some of our other districts because we have um, we have this uh, because the the appreciation of the property has been so significant. So that's what I'd say. So it's not the teardowns. You, you, you don't mind tearing it down if it takes a year to tear it down. That's fine. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that I think it gives people the opportunity for a thoughtful process. So, I'll, again, I'll use just an example from uh, my neighborhood where uh, there was someone who brought a, bought an a old house that they had planned to tear it down. Uh, the historic commission, uh, they went to the historic commission. The historic commission put a year delay on it. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure the, the right terminology. Uh, the, uh, there was a lot of, you know, good work and discussion done about that, and the people, the, the, the house is a, you know, still remains. They've put on a really nice addition, and I think everybody's happy about it. So I think it gives a delay to give people the opportunity for thoughtful consideration. So again, you know, you aren't, it still seems to me that you don't care about the teardowns. You just don't want to torn down within a year. You want them to take a year before they no, tear it down. I think that the fact that you get a year makes it less likely that the teardown will occur. Okay. I guess I differ on that. Uh, people that have the money that want the property would probably be willing to wait a year to make that. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I, I think we've had a healthy discussion on this item. I recognize Councilman Davis. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I'm a little bit torn also, and I, I, we've spent a lot of time on, on this council talking about affordable housing and making sure that we don't want to put people who uh, feel that so-called gentrification is pushing them out of the neighborhoods. Um, so I'm, I'm, I want us to be consistent. And for that reason, um, and the whole idea that uh, many of the people who might have to leave the neighborhood because of issues around gentrification would suffer. So I'm going to be opposed to the plan that's on the table now and the motion. Mayor? Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, thank you. Um, I do want to say, I think, as we saw with the proponents and opponents and discussion on council, there's good arguments on both sides of this issue. Ultimately, what I've realized is the most compelling um, item for me, uh, the case was raised that had this been addressed much earlier, that there would be uh, likely be more support for it. Seven years ago, at its peak, um, the petitioners were able to get signatures representing only 26% of the acreage, only 28% of the number of lots. And um, this is a significant um, change in the use restrictions on these properties. And um, I, I don't find it compelling that that just over a quarter of the people who, that this will be imposed upon were supportive of it at the time that it had its um, 
at the time the petition was submitted and what we've been told is it's a most support. So I will be voting against it tonight. Thank you. Call the question. If there's no further discussion, we call the question on the motion. All in favor of the motion as proposed, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, indicate by saying nay. No. no. Uh, it's four to three if you want to, did you get that? Those that are opposed, can you raise the hands? Opposed? Yeah. Opposed. You have? Okay, thank you. We're gonna to move to the next item. Is there anything else that staff needs? Okay. Item 16, zoning map change, Fletcher's Mill. Thank you, Jacob, we, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. A zoning map change request has been received from SP Fletcher's Mill for one parcel located at 2018 Fletcher's Mill Road. Uh, this site is currently zoned residential rural, and the applicant is requesting to change that designation to plan development residential 1.964 or PDR 1.964. Um, the development plan associated with this application commits to a maximum of 68 single family residential units at the site. Um, there has been one technical correction to the development plan. Um, the plan in your packet shows a uh, portion of a project boundary buffer in the Duke power easement. Um, we caught that late last week. That has since been shifted um, outside of the power easement so that it complies with the UDO requirements. Some key commitments on the proposed development plan include site access points, uh, tree preservation areas, and project boundary buffers and riparian features. The Planning Commission recommended approval of this case by a vote of 13 to 0 at their April 11, 2017 hearing. Um, and staff determines that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and, any, and applicable policies and ordinances. There'll be two uh, motions required for this item. The first motion would be for a consistency statement and the second would be for a zoning ordinance. And I'm happy to answer any questions the council may have at this time. Well, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report. I would ask other questions by members of the council of the staff. If not, we have one person that has signed up to speak on this item, uh, proponent Patrick Biker. Before Patrick comes, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item that's being a public hearing? I recognize Patrick Biker for three minutes. Good evening, Mayor Bell, members of council. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm here representing the property owner, SCP, which is Shamrock Capital Partners, Fletcher's Mill, LLC. I um, want to thank the planning department for the staff report, and uh, since we have a unanimous recommendation for approval from the planning commission, I'll refrain from my using up my remaining two and two minutes and 47 seconds and just ask if you all have any questions. If not, we appreciate your time tonight. We, we respectfully ask for your approval. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of the recognized Councilman Shule? <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Biker. Yes, sir. Um, good to see you. Um, I noticed that, uh, well, let me just ask these, I'll ask them together. Uh, you all, the development's adding nine students to uh, the population projected for Durham Public Schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's, uh, uh, have you all considered the, uh, what many developers have done of, of uh, donating $500 per student to uh, Durham Public Schools uh, to, no, I'm sorry, Council Member Shule, we haven't had a chance to consider that. I did note the schools that are being served by this, the, the schools that would serve this development are Merrick Moore, Neal, and Southern. Uh, I, had the op I was actually pleased that we were had a development in this area because I personally tutored in Neal Middle School. I may have mentioned it to you. So um, I'm pleased that we'll be having new homes built with those uh, schools, but I'm sorry, we haven't had a chance to debate that, or just, I'm sorry, not debate it, but discuss that. How about I believe those schools are all, my impression is they're under capacity. I'm not sure if that's true. Yeah. Um, 
You're also adding 68 new units of housing. Have you considered a contribution to the city's dedicated housing fund? No, sir. Would you consider such a contribution? I, I'm afraid my client is actually a, a, a venture capital fund out of Greensboro, and they couldn't make it here tonight. So I'm afraid I don't have the ability to uh, authorize that at, at this point in time. But it is a very um, small increase in housing, and it is on, you may have noticed, it's actually on the edge of our suburban tier. We've actually segregated off a small portion of this site that's in the critical area and preserved that with absolutely no development whatsoever. So. Uh, given its location, given that, we, we didn't consider that particular issue since most of the affordable housing issues are much closer to our downtown area. What do you think the price point of these houses might be? I really don't know, sir. I represent the property owner. They're, they're, they'll be working with a, a home, home builders to determine that. I, I don't know. The, the houses in that area are, seem to have very reasonable price points. If you drive up and down Fletcher's Mill Road, Okay. Most of them are brick ranch houses that were built in the decades after World War II. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the other persons who want to speak, if not, I'm going to close the public hearing as a matter of fact before the council. Move the consistency. Oh, excuse me. Second. Okay. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Move the item. Second. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Move to item 18. 17. Did, did, did I miss it? 17. 17. Zoning map change session law 2017-80, Wake County initial zonings. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins again with the Planning Department. Um, on June 29, 2017, the North Carolina General Assembly uh, formally approved session law 2017-80, which annexed 56 areas uh, known as donut holes, um, basically properties or portions of property under county jurisdiction, which are completely sound, or surrounded by the city limit, um, into the city of Durham, effective June 30, 2017. Um, ten of these parcels are either wholly or partially within Wake County and are now subject to City of Durham zoning. Um, staff is recommending that the council apply the Residential Suburban 10 Zoning District to these properties, um, as this is a district that staff found is most similar to the current designation of Residential 4 under the City of Raleigh's zoning jurisdiction. Um, on August 8, 2017, the Durham Planning Commission recommended approval of this change. Um, by a vote of 10 to 0. Um, staff also recommends the RS-10 designation for these properties, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have at this time. Again, this is a public hearing. You've heard the staff report. The public hearing is open. I would ask for the questions by members of the council. Uh, hearing none, is anyone in the public that wants to speak on this item, either for or against? Uh, let the record reflect no one in the public asks to speak on this item. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. As a matter of fact, for the council. Move the, the consistency, consistency statement. Second. second. Oh. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Move the item. Second. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. We now move to <laughs> item 18. <coughs> Zoning map change, Sessions Law 2017-80. Durham County initial. Uh, Jacob Wiggins again with the planning department. This item is for the Durham County, or I should say the parcels located entirely within Durham County that were part of session law 2017-80. Um, this item would affect 411 parcels. Staff is recommending an exact translation for all county designated zoning. Um, and staff recommends approval of that. Two motions would be required for this item, the first being a consistency statement, and the second being the zoning ordinance. And I'm happy to answer any questions the council may have regarding this item. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report. Uh, I would ask our questions by members of the council. We do have one person that has signed up to speak. I recognize uh, Barbara. Garman, is that correct? Uh, you, you have three minutes. Good evening. I apologize for my coughing interruptions. I've got acute bronchitis. I didn't hear. Um, 
Could you just state your name and address, please? Oh, uh, yeah. Hi. <laughs> I'm Barbara Garman. I live at 4603 Hunters Ridge Trail in Durham. Hunters Ridge Trail is over off of Farrington Road, for those who don't know where it is. And I am, I want to thank you all for everything that you do, but at the same time, on July the 13th, I came home and I had a letter from the city manager welcoming me into the city of Durham. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Let us all add our welcome to that. Welcome it was, to, um, to my, my surprise, it was a result of the Senate State Bill number 266. All of you received an email from me on July the 20th. All of you did. I heard a response back from two of you. Um, the bill, the way that it's written, and this is the bill right here, it states that in the top, it says it's an act adding certain described property to the corporate city limits of the city of Durham because the property is completely surrounded by the city's corporate limits. My property as of June the 29th was not surrounded or touching any city property. And I really took issue with why did Durham have this as a North Carolina Senate bill vote in the House of North Carolina. Why did the representatives of Mecklenburg, Buncombe County, Wayne County have a concern about my property being in the city of Durham? That bothered me a lot because I was real concerned that why didn't this panel take care of it? And then I did a little bit more research and I found out that three or four years ago, it was put before our state representative, Mr. McKenzie, to put this on the floor then. Well, now it was started in March of this year that Mr. McKenzie had it, and there were three readings on this particular state bill, 266. And it went through. After speaking with two of the council people on the telephone, I was told that y'all were totally unaware it was even in Raleigh on the floor. And I'm like, that was very concerning to me that the city council people don't even know what's going on with the city of Durham over in Raleigh. That bothered me. And so I've got five pages here, and I think I'm on page six now, and I don't know where I am. <laughs> but I was just real concerned about it. And I don't see why my property, which is not connected to the city properties anywhere, why you want me. I got four acres that back up to the Federal Reserve Plain of Jordan Lake Watershed to a property. I've got the maps here. I, anything I've got, I'll be happy to share with you. I started to make copies, but I'm not real sure how many copies to make. But um, it, I apologize. Basically, this is my property. This is the Jordan Lake flood plan back here. Uh, excuse, excuse me for just a minute. Let, let it take five minutes, since if you don't mind, go ahead. Thank you. Um, this this is the the um, this is an HOA um, homeowner association for the Prescott Place. They do not pay city taxes. This eight acres right here, they don't pay city taxes. The federal government doesn't pay city taxes. My property is right here. And I am not, no, that's the looking size. This is my property here. I am not surrounded by city property anywhere. My closest city neighbor is here. This gentleman is not, this I'm not, these people are not. So please explain to me why this bill reads in the top, it is surrounded by city limits. I'm not. I am on a fixed income. I am 66 years old. I went to Y.E. Smith over on Driver Avenue. I went to Holton. I graduated Durham High. I'm a Durhamite. I'm proud of it. I understand a lot of the statements that have been made in here tonight. I read on how to speak to the city council. They said, don't get emotional, but it is emotional to me. I've, my family has been in that house 36 years. I now have to consider putting it on the market because the city taxes the, the assessment raised my house payment $100 last year. Now I can only imagine what my escrow is going to be with my house payment, which I cannot afford on a fixed income of Social Security. I want to keep continuing raising my grandchildren there. Got swing sets. We got hiking trails. And I don't know what to do. 
because I've been told that once it goes by a state bill, there's nothing you can do. So I, I don't understand it, and it's bothersome. And it's a shame that it went to Raleigh on the floor, and my city council didn't even know it. Yeah, go ahead, I was going to say something. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Ms. Garman? Uh-huh. I just want to clarify one thing and then ask you a question. But first of all, I want to say I really appreciate you coming down here. I know we all do. And we're very sympathetic to your situation. We're not unsympathetic to it. I want you to hear that. Um, so we didn't know it was on the floor. It's true. But it is also true that it has been something that we as a city council have wanted. It's not that Senator McKissick went off by himself and did something that we hadn't already wanted. Because, And the reason it's done is that um, it's hard to render good service like think about fire service, for example, if you don't exactly know who's in charge of it. And that's what these donut holes have created, is an inability to, for us to render good public safety service and fire service and other things like that to people who are inside them or just maybe on the other side of them because we haven't known who, to, you know, who should be getting there and when they should be getting there. And so it's been complicated. And we want to render good emergency service and fire service and police service to people. That's That's one of the underlying reasons. Uh, but my question is, have you availed yourself of the, uh, the circuit breaker, the tax circuit breaker? Because um, if you are on a fixed income, if you're on Social Security and fixed income, and you're 66 years old, um, you should be a, able to qualify for the county's circuit breaker, which applies both city and county taxes. Yeah, I have that print out here. I don't qualify. I have a three-quarter job because I, I like to stay employed. Sure. And um, I, you know, fixed income, but I also have a three-quarter part-time job, and yeah. my salary puts me out. I understand. And, I, and I'm proud of what I do. I'm proud of, you know, having standards and morals. I was raised to take responsibility. Sure. And I will, and I do. But now the opportunity to do that has been taken away from me. You know, right now, where the solid waste container comes to the property closest to me is 600 feet away, and I've been told that the waste container trucks will not come down there. I have to drag my container, if it's full, which is over 100 pounds, over 600 feet, down an incline and up an incline. I can't do it. Well, in that case, we do have someone come, can come get it for you. I'm sure the manager. I need to know how to do that. I know that I'm, I'm a quarter mile off Farrington Road. I am not going to get city water and sewer anytime, probably not in my lifetime. I appreciate the 50% discount for city and water that you're going to give me on my taxes, but I don't think I saw it reflected on my tax bill. How come y'all can't extend that 50% a little bit longer until it's on the books and planned? Even that would help. I don't, because the city water is at 24.7%, and it's a little pie chart. And the way I read it and the way I look at it, I've done a lot of homework on this, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm aware of everything. And, you know, the 24.7% for city and water, thank you for the 50% you give me for one year, but I don't think it was applied to my tax bill. I would like to know if it was. Let, let, let me try something else. Uh, and I'm not the attorney. This is the attorney sitting next to Patrick, <laughs> Patrick Baker. Hi, Mr. Baker. <laughs> I, I guess the question is, if, if in fact the property doesn't meet the requirements, then is there an exception to that? I mean, specifically, we were talking about, as, she, as we said, Staff it's surrounded. Huh? Staff can address that. Okay, thank you. Yes. Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Yeah, just to clarify, yeah, um, Ms. Harmon's property itself um, was not directly adjacent to the corporate limits. However, she was part of a group of three or four properties. Those themselves comprised the Wait donut hole. So, 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 so in the middle of, a, of other properties that are that are part yeah. of a donut hole. Oh. Yeah, so it was a group of properties, including hers, which constituted the donut hole that was annexed as part of this legislation. And as I discussed with you, it reads, if the property 
is surrounded. My property is not the way it's read. That's the question I was trying to get sure. at. Yeah, so uh, my, yeah, my response is I, I would agree with Ms. Harmon that the title is somewhat confusing. I think property is meant to be viewed as a plural in that regard. If you read further down in the bill, starting at section one, it says specifically that these properties are going to be annexed into the city of Durham. I think that is the meat of the bill itself. So all of those properties that are listed are there. They're well, let, let me ask it another way. Mm -hmm. Does her property meet the wording of the bill itself? No, it does not. No. Okay, so it's, if you, I'm sorry. I mean, if does it meet the little wording of the bill? It does not meet that criteria. If you review property as a singular form, as in just one particular piece that's, of property, that's, yeah, that's what, yeah, that's what, that's what I'm. That's how it's so, written. Sure. Yeah. So it, it seems to me, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we've listed it, it doesn't meet that requirement. I assume that all these other properties do meet it. Mm. They don't. Mm. Okay. Well, I'm, I, I guess I need to back off then. <laughs> we might have a bigger problem. Mayor, I thought, yeah. if, if, if Please, I, I want to hear you talk some more. <laughs> <laughs> if if I could jump in and. Sure. Um, the, the issue, and, and I'm looking at the wording here, it's the properties that are surrounded, and I think we're, we're getting mixed in between surrounded versus contiguous. Um, because if you look at the dot, and I'm not sure exactly which dot it, it is, but that dot is a series of dots that are surrounded by the city, the city limits. Um, if it read, you know, that it is completely okay. contiguous, that's, okay. that's the I, difference. I, 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 get I accept that. Mr. Attorney. I ask a quick clarifying question? Yes. Um, it's my understanding that when you read a piece of legislation, the um, introduction and title of the bill, those parts of the document aren't necessarily operative legal language. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. The legal language of the bill itself indicates that the following parcels are incorporated into the city limits. Is that correct? That's correct. That's right. And I think that may be part of the confusion here is that the title itself could have a grammar error or a draft, slight drafting ambiguity as this apparently does. Um, and nonetheless, the operative legal language of the bill, which states that the following parcels will be incorporated into the city limits, um, is correct and has effect regardless of what the title may or may not say. Um, Mr. Mayor, the other thing I wanted to say since I forgot the microphone is that as my council, as my colleague, Council Member Shul has stated, we're all sympathetic to what you've said. Um, I was one of the folks that reached out to you and we had a conversation on email about this. Um, I also um, copied um, Senator McKissick's office in the hope that uh, someone from his staff would uh, double check whether or not your uh, particular lot was intended. But as the planning staff has told us here, obviously it was because you were essentially a hole inside another donut hole. And so if the bill were to have the effect that you want it to have, it would have created a new smaller donut hole consisting of your piece of property. I believe is that correct, correct Jacob? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing I wanted to mention is that I know that our staff can talk to you about the container issue, which you should not have to lug 600 feet down. We have a we have a program that does that, and there's not any problem with that. I would appreciate it. Um, I don't know how the 50%, whether it got allocated to this property tax bill or not, we can have staff look into that. But other than that, I hope you will understand, although it will be of no comfort to you, oh. that the city is a creature and a creation of the state. And the state government has passed a law that the governor signed that, I don't know, did the governor have to sign this? was a local bill. No, he signed it. Oh, he did, okay. He didn't have to. Um, he did. he, oh, well, how nice of him. Um, the, uh, that once that happens, we can't, there's not, I don't know that there's anything we can do about that. Um, and uh, so I, that's me telling you, I, I don't know that we can give you the relief you're asking for today. And, and I probably came in here with that understanding it's just sad. It's just sad. Yeah, I'm being faced with a lot of important, serious decisions I wasn't prepared to make right now. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garman. Well, we need to take some action on this item. Public hearing is closed. Move, move, to, con move to consistency statement. Second. So we're probably going to move and second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Move the item. 
Second. So improper moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Are there any other items to come before the council before we adjourn at 9.45 p.m.? If not, the council's adjourn at 9.45 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Still say I'll deserve an extra minute. <laughs> yeah, I'll make it up. We have we ways. We have a lot of people who So we have, like, big subdivisions. We have ways of making it up. Yeah.